been trying to take it easy Take it easy, but still take it Make it better if I break it Sometimes that gets hard If I slip to older ways And welcome to a Thursday morning edition of Real Talk at 1030 Eastern, 830 Mountain. Ryan Jesperson here with you from an, uh, an impromptu problem solving type home studio. Uh, Samuel G. Brooks, the technical producer of this program, uh, is today steering the good ship Real Talk from our in studio location. Morning, How are you doing this good? morning, my man? I'm good. Coffee's hot. I'm uh, I'm relaxed here. Uh, I my my grandparents were able to book a vaccine appointment, and that's the greatest thing that I can think of right now. So oh, that okay. is uh, so that is how excited I am. Yesterday was a was a a big day for the family. Then, as as uh, you sort of had your hearts in your throats, hoping that that the uh, the matriarch, the patriarch of the family could get in and, and sign up for the you vaccine. Betcha. And they have appointments for next week. So very okay. excited. Very excited okay. about that. How are they feeling? They're feeling great. They are, I mean, they, they're 90 and 96. They get a lot of home care. They're still feeling pretty isolated, you know, for a while. So it's just, this is a... This is a huge step forward for them. Um, it's it's been a tough year, you know. It's been I, I can't remember a year in, in recent memory when I've seen my grandparents this little. You know what I mean? It's just it's it's tough. So hopefully this. Did, gets did you us... say this? Did you say this little? You, you mean you've yeah. seen them so infrequently? Yes, that's what I mean. It's like they they, they are not, normally not... a regular part of my life, and and just I've Aww. I've I've stood in their backyard and yelled at them through their windows more times than I can count now. And I'd like to stop doing that. <laughs> yeah. Very well said, Sam. Well, we know that uh, yesterday as, as we were live putting the show together, it was the first day for, for context for those outside Alberta. Yesterday was the first day that Albertans uh, over the age of 75 could register to get their vaccines. And it was, well, it was, it was, it was a bit of a disaster to be honest. Um, Alberta Health Services, by way of the health minister yesterday, saying, hey, right around the time that that website went live, the web portal uh, went live. And I'm already, by the way, using uh, terminology that takes me out of my depth. Um, the good news is coming up in about a half an hour, we have, uh, quite frankly, one of the smartest people on planet Earth that's going to join us to talk about what he was able to do. I don't know if Corey Mathewson wants me using the phrase hacked because I don't technically mean hacked. Uh, and maybe Sam can even jump in on this too, because Sam, it's there, there's there, we 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 invoke the word hack in different ways, right? We might say, "Oh my gosh, this banking software was hacked," or we might say, "You know, a podcast, you know, a pod platform was hacked." 
uh, that would indicate there was some nefarious intent that people were harmed. And then we talk about things that people post on TikTok and Instagram that we say, these are life hacks. This is a way to I do things life more. Hacks. <laughs> life hacks. You know, this is Sam, you strike me as a guy that knows about a thousand life hacks, uh, but, but <laughs> things, things that can make your life easier. There's, there's yeah. no nefarious note to it. And, and Corey essentially designed a way. How would you put it in layperson's terms? We'll ask him in half an hour, but, but he determined a way that people, that everyday folks could get in kind of through the back door of the website. You know, yeah. And, and- and I'm, I'm going to, I'll let him tell the story, but um, all he was using was developer console, which is just built into Chrome browser. So on any website, you can open that up and see the code behind that website. And essentially what he was able to do is take a little look, see through that, see that there was a part of the website that was timing out and not displaying properly. And he just turned it right. back on. That was it. Oh, it, it oh was is a that very it? Simple fix. Oh, that's yeah. it. Oh, that's it. Oh, that's it. it. Yeah. He oh. just, just turned oh, the, the government he, website back on. He just went through the back door of the government website, realized that it was experiencing some problems and <clears throat> rectified it himself from his home city of Montreal so his grandparents could sign up for their vaccinations. Okay, got it. <laughs> this is, it. honestly, Sam, it, Sam and I were having so much fun, as, as probably you were too at home, um, watching people respond to what Corey did and the firsthand accounts of, of like, you know, thank you to you, my elderly father was able to book in, or thank you to you, the stress is off our family. I mean, it was really remarkable. We're going to talk to him coming up, as mentioned, in about 25 minutes. Um, and his CV, his resume, I get the sense, like, I've had these interviews a couple of times in my career. Uh, I think of uh, the, the two times that I was lucky enough to interview uh, Commander Chris Hadfield, International Space Station. Same sort of a thing. I've talked to uh, uh, cardiovascular surgeons and neurologists that have developed technologies uh, that that really uh, I can't even describe for you right now because they don't even, you know, the, <clears throat> sort of these mechanical heart units that you can carry around with you like a, a lunch pail while you're waiting for a transplant and it keeps the blood pumping through your system even though there's no heart in your chest cavity. I mean, the, these types of things where as a human being, you're, you're talking to these people, these very impressive people. And the, the entire time you're going, does this person realize that I'm not even qualified to talk to them at a casual level? That am I, am I offending this person by, by the, the entry level nature of my questions? That's what I, that's what I'm a little, I'm just giving you a little peek behind the curtain. This is how I'm feeling leading up to our interview with, uh, with Corey Matthewson, who's coming up at nine o'clock. I know what he's going to say. He'll be uh, disarming and wonderful and humble and all of the things that true geniuses typically are. And I think we're all going to learn something. We'll we'll probably stick on the subject matter for, you know, six or eight minutes, and then we'll have a chance to to get into everything else that he does working at deep mind. And is, Oh, and by the way, he's a celebrated uh, improvisational theater performer too. So that should be a great conversation today coming up at nine 30. This is one of the neat things that happens. Our show now is in, we're into our 11th week of doing shows with you. And so this means we've got a bit of a history, right? We've, we've talked about some things we've given you as an audience, a chance to respond. And then you have followed up with some ideas on how we might follow up on the stories. And, and here you are. Now we're doing some you know, some sort of exploration, if you will, on subject matter today coming up at 930 Mountain Time. If you're tuning in live, if you're listening to the podcast about an hour from now, we're going to talk to two Canadian beef producers. And we wanted to talk about uh, there's a convergence of two issues we've been getting to. Number one, is it possible to produce, quote unquote, sustainable beef? And you remember we talked to Dr. Frank Mitloner uh, out of the University of uh, California just uh, a few days ago talking about sustainable beef out of UC Davis. Well, we had many of you reach out and say, hey, you were also talking about that story out of Portland, right? The story out of Portland with food waste and the Fred Meyer grocery store and the, the police that were that were guarding the, the, the dumpster. And we got into many different angles on food security and, and what that means and, and how society should responsibly respond to issues around food security or, or, or simply not wasting. Uh, you know, food waste is probably a more accurate way to to describe the tone of that conversation. Well, we've heard from several people that said, you know, there's a story here about sustainable beef ranching and addressing food waste. And they go hand in hand. And we said, yeah, well, obviously we're all ears. And so coming up in about an hour from now, we're going to talk to Ryan Casco from Casco Cattle Company and Jill Burkhart from Crooked Lake Farm. Very much looking forward to that conversation. And we'll wrap up today's show. I dare you to tell me 
that this isn't worth the spotlight. I'm not trying to butter you up. I'm not trying to milk this story for, for, for more than it deserves. All right. We're not trying to simply turn the waters and, and, and cause great unrest among our listening audience. But have you been following Buttergate? I know there are other stories that you probably say we should be paying closer attention to. But the fact of the matter is many, many people are focusing on butter right now, saying there's something different about it and not in a good way. And what's going on here? So Julie Van Rosendahl, who's uh, the food editor, she's a contributing editor, rather, for the Globe and Mail. She's a CBC columnist, radio columnist, food. Uh, I mean, she's a cookbook author. She's a legend at dinnerwithjulie.com. She's, uh, you know, just been doing great things across Canada uh, for many years now. And, and she's established herself as somewhat of an authoritative voice. She took on this story and she's discovered some remarkable things about the state of butter, the state of Canadian butter. And we're going to talk about it. It's actually a huge story. Like, I hate to always have to reference other news outlets, but put it this way. It was the lead story on the BBC the other night. That's right. In the UK, on the number one newscast, the lead story was Canadian butter. So Julie Van Rosendahl is going to get into that with us. Now, I've laid out some fun stuff on the show today. Now we're going to talk about sustainable beef and ranching, and that's pretty cool. We're going to talk about butter, and we're going to learn how a genius, a brilliant mind, helped out his grandparents by, by you know, in a fun way, I'm using the word hacking a government site and making life easier for everybody. And, but you're all, you're bracing yourselves, aren't you? If you're listening from, if you're watching from Alberta, you're, you're bracing yourself because you're going, if I know anything about real talk, they're, they're also going to address the fact that uh, it's budget day and there's a budget that's going to drop. That's probably going to be pretty painful, right? A lot of people are going, Oh boy, what's this one going to look like? The economy's in the tank. We're in the middle of a pandemic right now. The government in Alberta has promised to, to bring this budget into balance. Now, obviously, we have to put that into context because it feels like eons ago that a promise like that was even, you know, uh, keepable. Uh, but uh, it, today's going to be a day where we're going to learn how the United Conservative government is going to approach cuts and spending and investments and stimulus uh, I suppose I should say stimuli. Uh, we're going to get that from the finance minister, Travis Tapes, coming up later today. What does the official opposition think about it? Now, they haven't seen it yet, but there are some things they'll be keeping an eye out for. And we're going to talk to Lethbridge West MLA. She's the official opposition finance critic, Shannon Phillips, coming up in just about one minute from now. It's a perfect time for me to remind you, speaking of expenditures, speaking of balance sheets, speaking of investments, if you're thinking about expanding or broadening your investments, your portfolio to include cryptocurrency, and this is not my endorsement that you do so, but I know a lot of people are talking about Bitcoin. The most common thing that we hear on the show is maybe you just don't know quite enough about it. You don't quite understand it enough to, to take any sort of meaningful action on it. Well, this is where our presenting sponsors, Bitcoin Well, comes into the mix. They're proud to be based out of Edmonton, despite the fact they're a national uh, entity. You're going to see their Bitcoin ATMs across Canada. They're going public this year as well. If you have questions about crypto, you want to find out if it's a good fit for you, you can check out Bitcoin Well. Just link to them right at the top of the sponsors page there. Well, under my under my special message to you, just under that, under the sponsors page at ryanjesperson.com. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. As mentioned, budget day today, and people are going to be keeping an eye on it. Um, oh, by the way, this is a great time to let you know that if you're watching us on YouTube, if you're watching this interview, Sam Brooks has just been killing it from the studio, managing me at home and our guests chiming in, and there's a bunch of tech stuff that we're not going to waste your time with, but you're going to see some cool stuff behind the scenes actually on the screen as Sam brings in and says goodbye to our guests through the day, you're, you're going to kind of, we get a look. I mean, this kind of fits with what we're talking to Corey about uh, our expert uh, in just a moment, Corey Matthewson. So we're going to, we get to see kind of in a way what Sam does behind the scenes this week on, on real talk. It's, it's kind of a neat angle or a different way to do it right now. We've got Shannon Phillips kind of side. It looks like you're very uncomfortable sideways up on the wall there. You know, I'm, I'm, we got, we got to get, there you go. Yeah. Or Sam, there you go. I, you know, I should get out of the way uh, because Sam is typically the one that does a wonderful job.
the NDP government, now official opposition finance critic. Um, uh, it might seem like an obvious question, but sometimes they get interesting answers. Uh, how do you approach budget day differently as a member of the official opposition? Well, uh, you know, the budget is uh, uh, generally the cake is baked, you know, through January and February. Uh, and uh, so you know what's coming, obviously, when you're in government. And uh, uh, your main job is to uh, keep it zipped until the finance minister steps up to the uh, to his lectern and, and delivers his speech. Um, and of course, there's a lot of deliberation that goes into it uh, beforehand. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's specific processes that go into a budget making process. And, and that you know, really gives you a, a, an advantage, I think, when you go into, uh, uh, in the opposition, when you go into lockup and so on, which I had done, you know, previously as a staffer way back uh, many, many years ago, because you know what you're looking for. Uh, and, and so what usually happens is we go in uh, first thing in the morning, uh, uh, the media goes into their own uh, situation as well, and you just spend time with the documents, uh, uh, getting to know them, understanding uh, uh, what the priorities are that the government has laid out, what kind of changes they've made, uh, what, how that compares over time, and you get hours and hours to do that until, again, the, the finance minister uh, steps up to the lecture in the, in the house and begins his speech, uh, and then you go out and talk to the media. I've got a, a message here, a comment on our live chat from Tracy, who's watching in, and she, she doesn't strike me as especially excited for today. She says, I really, you know, I couldn't possibly care less about the budget. It's BS. And it seems like nobody has any idea what they're talking about. Anyway, they're going to screw us even more. So what's even the point about caring? It's a joke. Now, I know you're going to tell us we should care and people do care, but people are bracing themselves today. Uh, I would say public sector workers are bracing themselves. People in certain industries are, are bracing themselves. Uh, what are you expecting to see in broad strokes first out of the gates? Well, I, you know, I think people are right to approach it, A, with a, uh, with a quite a bit of cynicism, as uh, Tracy has, because last year, you know, the, the budget projections were completely wackadoodle. They had no reference uh, to reality. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, they rammed that, that budget through uh, using a whole bunch of excuses and sort of undemocratic means. And it was just really, really sad day uh, for for budget transparency and the and the way things usually work, we usually pretty high standards here in Alberta. And no matter if you if you liked Ralph Klein's priorities or not, he set out really nice rules and and transparency for how we talk about budgets in Alberta. And that is a that is great. That is a good thing, and we should have that. These guys have blown holes in all of that over the last uh, eighteen months to two years. It's uh, it, it is not. Uh, the same process and the same way that they they present information that they they used to that tried to get away with all kinds of things. So Tracy's absolutely right. Having said all of that, you will still get a good sense of what's going to happen in your healthcare and education system. What's going to happen with your personal income tax rate? You know, if they're going to go back to indexing that so you don't get a tax hike. Um, what's going to happen to you know booze, smokes, uh, uh, fuel, those kinds of things. Uh, I, but also what the government's priorities are for diversification and attracting new investment and broadening our economy. Uh, you're also going to get some clues about how they want to run things like age and income support and how they actually view the most vulnerable in our society. Uh, but most of all, you're going to get a, a sense of whether they have used this moment to rise to the occasion of the challenges that COVID has, has uh, presented to us to lay out some kind of economic plan that actually meets the moment. That to me, I thought you were about to launch into something profound. So I took a big gulp of coffee and, and just about choked on it. Um, that to me, Shannon, is, is the big one because I don't think that any reasonable person right now is expecting to see and as a matter of fact it would be it would be impossible not technically but realistically impossible for this government to bring in a budget that would represent anything close to a path to balance i mean it depends on how you describe laying the pathway but the economy the, the economic factors right now are so significant that the, the spending around covid though that may be more relevant at a federal level to be quite honest uh, the way, you know, the, the economy is at right now, the dynamics of the, the oil market and everything else, um, which gives us an opportunity, obviously, here to talk about diversification. But there are some realities that mean that this budget, I mean, on the heels of, of what's a 20 plus billion dollar deficit in the past year, um, Alberta's debt looking, you know, right around 100 billion dollars right now uh, is going to be one I think that'll be, be uh, difficult for people to swallow for different reasons. What a lot of people will be paying close attention to is where are the priorities on diversification? Where are the supports for entrepreneurs? Where are the supports for, uh, you know, reflecting? I think where are the investments for reflecting where, where global trends are going? 
I mean, are these along the lines of, of kind of the key questions you're asking as, as the person that's going to be responsible to stand up in the legislature and hold this government accountable? Absolutely. And, and, and that's the piece that is most important here is, is that we actually have a thoughtful approach to putting people to work. That's the real path to balance we need right now. You know, governments around the world, and, and Alberta is no exception, uh, are, are running deficits in this uh, moment of responding to COVID. That's a given. The question is what you are spending money on. Right. So these guys have burned through billions of dollars, but not put a single person to work, not attracting new investment, not establishing the investor confidence that we need for clean tech companies, digital media companies, renewables, agriculture, value added, petrochemical upgrading, uh, uh, whatever the case may be. They're not uh, spending uh, any time, let alone any targeted investment on those uh, on those things, because we even need thoughtful public policy to be able to broaden and diversify the economy. We don't necessarily always need to meet it with money. We need to meet it with the proper kinds of fiscal instruments. Right now, uh, what we've seen though is these guys piss away billions on things that are not people's priority, right? 1.5 billion uh, uh, dumped into, you know, a casino bet on a, on a Trump White House. We've seen 4.7 billion given away uh, in, to already profitable corporations, uh, uh, to folks making more than a half a million dollars in profit every year, and that's their job strategy. So the question isn't, you know, uh, are we spending? We are. The question is on what and what is the outcome that the province is driving at for that money. And we haven't seen uh, either uh, thing conform to people's priorities, right? Uh, we've seen them spending money on things that are not people's priorities. And uh, people have a priority of, uh, they've told us anyway, that they want the government to drive towards an outcome of broadening the economy. Uh, we've not seen them articulate what that is. Uh, or, or you know, any sense of vision other than driving down the road looking in the rearview mirror. Shannon, can you give us a sense of? I, I know that I mean, you know, people will understand. I think for the most part, when when you've got a majority government, um, in most circumstances, you don't really need. I mean, you don't need to be propped up by anybody. And in most circumstances, you don't really need to cooperate. You don't, as we've seen evidence, you don't necessarily need to to consult in meaningful fashion. Uh, leading up to this budget process, is, is this a is this a closed door sort of a, a government caucus type process? Is the official opposition? Does the NDP? Do you? Does Rachel Notley? Does anybody else have any have any say? Do you put forward any suggestions or any top asks to this government? How would you describe the dynamic, I guess, is what I'm getting at? Well, I mean, our job as official opposition is sure to, to hold the government to account, but it's also to, to reflect the wishes of the people, which is exactly what we've been doing. Uh, so we've done budget town halls. I mean, obviously, they're different than uh, in, in previous years, but we've been undertaking this Alberta's Future Project where we've been doing targeted uh, consultations with various uh, sector groups and, and groups of uh, interested individuals uh, on things like hydrogen and geothermal, renewables, uh, rural broadband uh, uh, technology, uh, and uh, uh, those kinds of, of, of areas. We've released paper, uh, position papers on, on a number of these uh, items on ways that we're thinking about and reflecting back what Albertans are telling about us about diversification. And you know, when we release those papers, sometimes we will get uh, uh, some things wrong, we'll get some things right. We want to hear what those things are. We want this process to be iterative and back and forth with people. We think that reflects the, the, the right level of, of humility, uh, of, of listening to people, listening to Albertans and, and what they want to hear about what our future uh, uh, looks like. And uh, because ultimately, I think Albertans really do have good ideas and, and uh, are the right kinds of suggestions for how to diversify the economy and barreling ahead with, you know, only Jason uh, Kenny's idea of, of uh, or, you know, a small group of people in the premier's office uh, uh, that shook out of the Harper uh, era. You know, that's that's really not, uh, I think, going to end up with the sorts of outcomes that you want, which is actually reflecting the broad diversity of this province and, and the broad levels of expertise in, in, in matters economic. Right. We have uh, we have a great deal of private sector activity uh, and energy in, in this province, and that can be leveraged to, to make us that pass uh, that goes forward and, and something that actually meets the profound challenges that we have now. Right. Like I, I, I have consulted with so many people in the private sector who understand very clearly that obviously you need a well-functioning healthcare system right now in the middle of a global pandemic where people are are uh, uh, dying and the hospitals are filling up. We need uh, that is foundational to an economic recovery. 
you know, so it's not this old 90s idea of, of you know, it's public services or it's economy. Uh, I, you know, I think entre entrepreneurs and others and economists and, and others of today understand that those things go together. They need to be thoughtfully integrated. Uh, I do need fiscal anchors, but, but those need to be reflective of what's actually going to grow the economy, right? Yeah, I have, man, I always reach these crossroads in interviews, uh, oftentimes with you, where I want to respond and it would take me like three minutes because I want to kind of really dig into it. But I also have relatively limited time with you and I have other questions. But I, I will say this. Um, it's been interesting to see the language over the past couple of years uh, in how the government has communicated about public sector workers, in particular, educators, healthcare workers, because you get the sense, obviously, I mean, what, what, what the government's doing is, is, number one, I think there's a certain ideology. Every government has its own ideology. That's undeniable. But there's a certain ideology around the public sector um, that, that is there inherent. And then there's also, of course, the, the acknowledgement or the awareness that there are some big negotiations coming up that, that probably will get pretty contentious that I think will start at 0% increases from the government's position. Quite frankly, if I was negotiating on behalf of the government, I'd start at 0% too and probably try to work my way down. Um, hey, Ryan, I, it's, yeah. so did the NDP. 100%, 100%, you, 100%, 100% you did. You, I mean, you guys got, you know, Minister Hoffman at, at the time got doctors to take a 5% pay cut. We can talk about a lot about what the NDP did. All I'm saying is that, you know, it's it's a supercharged situation right now because, you know, you, you've got to get spending under control and you're probably going to have to hit public sector wages. But you're also doing so in the midst of a pandemic, which will make it even more unpopular. So the government's in a really tough position um, right now. Our question of the week at Ryan we're asking our viewers and our listeners uh, to tell us how they would put the budget together. We make, we, it's like a choose your own adventure and we get people to make really tough decisions. It's a great exercise. And they're doing the same thing at the next 30. And I talked to them yesterday about that, Dr. Trevor Toom and Ted Curry. And, and I participated in that exercise. They challenged us to find a $10 billion savings. And you know how I found 5 billion right away, Shan? A 5% sales tax. Boom. Right away, I added $5 billion to government coffers. Now this government, there's not a chance in hell that they're bringing in a sales tax regardless the government previous, the NDP, also very, I remember talking to Joe Cece many times about a sales tax, and he acknowledged it would be wildly unpopular in Alberta. Is this the time to do it? Well, look, Ryan, I mean, first of all, you know, did you adjust the corporate tax rate? Because uh, there's no I need did. for it to be, you know, uh, at eight. We should, it should be, you know, something reflective of uh, uh, other jurisdictions, right? Because there's no real competitive advantage to just a race to the bottom and giving away a whole bunch of money to the already profitable. So that's the first thing. You know, I think the second thing here is, is uh, uh, you know, now is not the time. Uh, for that kind of, of uh, uh, public policy. And, the, uh, you know, the premier's been pretty clear on that. And, uh, and so has Rachel Notley. I think ultimately, you why know, I need Shannon, to- Why though, Shannon, why, 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 why? Why? Well, I mean, the, first of all, people don't want it, Ryan. So you have a fundamental problem of democracy here. Right. Where, like, you know, if there's tall foreheads on, on Twitter who want to pay a little bit more because they're working from home uh, and, and they haven't been laid off in the pandemic, that's one perspective. But, you know, uh, that is not- uh, the lived reality of a lot of people who are hurting out there right now. They have lost their jobs. Not everyone can code from home, right? Like we got a lot of trades guys out there right now who are looking for work. I just talked to the, the uh, electrical workers the other night, a lot of uh, uh, folks in Calgary in particular who are out of work, they're looking for that investment in the green line. It's 20,000 trade jobs. You know, these are not people who particularly are interested in going to pay five or 6% more uh, when they go buy a pair of gloves, right? They're just not. And, uh, and they don't really understand why it is that Husky can lay off hundreds of people, take uh, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars outside of the uh, borders of this province, and they have to go in and uh, uh, pay more? Why exactly is that, right? And so you, you have a disconnect here with, with the lived reality of what people are, the kinds of pressures that they're feeling in terms of their, their budgets, um, and, uh, I, you know, what people in the ivory tower or, or the chattering classes and the, you know, the Twitterati and the commentariat uh, I think is good for them. And so, you know, if you, if you see that, that you've got uh, uh, some, you know, democratic impetus behind it, I think, you know, that's one thing. And, and I, I, in, that, in that sense, I agree with Premier Kenny, right? That, uh, that, that you, you'd probably need some kind of at least mandate for it. So if he wants to run on it in uh, uh, 2023, he's welcome to it. In my view, you, you were better off at this point to reflect uh, what people want 
uh, through broadening and diversifying the economy because then you're focusing on jobs, right? You're focusing on what the electorate wants, which is to gain somehow. Well, right? and let's, and I mean, feel let's acknowledge like they're losing. Yeah, Jason Kenny, Jason Kenny promised jobs, right? I mean, jobs, economy, yeah. pipelines. I always want to be reasonable. I'm not going to be some 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 guy that take. I know it, and I, and I want to take this this show in some direction where I'm like, you know, why isn't Jason Kenny delivering on the economy? And it's like, well, everything's fucked, right? I mean, actually, have you yeah. seen my? Uh, I don't know if you saw. I've got a special edition mug this morning. Um, oh, that's I, a good one. Yeah, I yeah. decided to I decided to go with my everything's fucked mug for budget day here in the province of Alberta today. But I your to, mug's to be, not wrong no. <laughs> to, to be reasonable. Uh, you know, there's only certain things the Alberta government can can uh, control or influence uh, as much as we hate to acknowledge it. The government can participate in advocacy on pipelines as part of its election platform uh, to to a fault which we saw, like you, you, you described it as a casino bet on a Trump White House, that, that billion and a half and maybe more uh, on, on Keystone. More. You know, there's exactly. And so the, so the government's, I think, you know, to a certain degree is able to say, hey, I mean, you know, we told you we'd invest in pipelines. So we did. OK, uh, the economy, you know, people want to see some form of leadership, but jobs. What I'm getting at here is of the three pillars of that promise, jobs is the one that people will still look and say you cannot simply give up because global oil prices are down. There are thousands of jurisdictions around the world where the job market has nothing to do with oil and gas, right? Well, it, you know, and and so we're still pulling the stuff out of the ground, Ryan. So, you know, a thoughtful plan for how we might uh, uh, derive more value from that, whether it's uh, in the clean tech space uh, uh, for, that, uh, for that upstream production. You know, there's lots of jobs uh, uh, that rely on things like uh, uh, the methane reductions. Uh, or other uh, clean technology for enhanced oil recovery or other ways that we can, you know, essentially take the carbon out of the barrel. Uh, so that's the first thing, right? Like we we are, uh, you know, about 20% of our GDP uh, comes from directly from upstream production, but there's still jobs even in in that sector that we can that we can look at, right? But not if you you know stomp around uh, uh, making speeches about how you know uh, everybody's out to get you, and there's some sort of global Soros conspiracy uh, lined up against you. Uh, you know, the, like that might distract you uh, from actually having thoughtful public policy on how to make sure that we are retrofitting uh, uh, wells with pneumatic devices, just as an example. Um, it, you know, so like you can't. Uh, you can't just say that it's about other uh, 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 industries as well. It's about the ones we've got. Uh, there are ways uh, to make our industry more competitive and to make sure that we are focusing our resources accordingly. Um, and then there's, you know, renewables and agriculture, which are, you know, I would argue, you know, down in in southern Alberta anyway. I mean, renewables is is now a a, a long standing. It's a historical industry <laughs> in Alberta. It's not, uh, you know, something newfangled. Uh, and so there's lots of opportunity there. You know, I uh, I went and looked in the Grassy Mountain filings to see how much property tax revenue that that uh, that uh, a coal mine proposal would be paying to the MD of Pinscher, or uh, MD of uh, Crow's Nest Pass and MD of Ranchlands. And it turns out it's about a million and a half a year they're projecting, and they always project on these things. Uh, and then I went and looked at the latest wind farm built in the MD of Pincher Creek. They're paying 1.6 million in linear and other uh, uh, taxes to the county, right? And uh, and that's one wind farm project. And I don't know if you've been to Pincher recently, but there's more than one wind farm project there. It, you know, like this, this whole idea that you know rural sustainability and all of that, uh, uh, you know, can't isn't compatible with uh, uh, some of the ways the world is going is ridiculous nonsense. You know, like the, the level, just the, the sheer numbers, and this is leaving aside all the unpaid taxes and oil and gas and all, all the massive liabilities that's been left for rural counties to deal with, right? So, you know, you can pe put people to work. You can have, have uh, uh, you know, thoughtful approaches, whether it's First Nations equity in, in some of these uh, renewables projects, whether it's community-owned uh, generation projects as we, we brought in. There's lots of ways that folks can make money and do their capitalism and broaden the economy, uh, uh, you know, and, and put people to work. Uh, that is the way that global capital is moving anyway. Um, and, and there's lots and lots of opportunities for us. Um, and this is to say nothing of obviously keeping people employed uh, uh, through healthcare and education, you know, uh, and, and, and 
robust public services. They're not mutually exclusive. Uh, and, uh, you know, as progressives don't need to put water in our wine uh, uh, to be putting forward an agenda where we are saying, look, there's a legitimate role for the private sector here and to grow and broaden the economy and to create wealth and prosperity in a way that, that actually drives towards better equity outcomes, but also to have decent public services. There, there is a way there. Uh, want to let people know, um, first of all, water in the wine. I haven't, heard, I haven't heard that frequently. I've got an aunt that puts crystal light in her wine. Not a joke. It's amazing. It's, it's an amazing party trend. Uh, I still put club soda uh, in my uh, uh, white wine because I want really? it to, to, oh yeah, because I, I don't really drink very much. So yeah, it's, it's. Is it I, I feel always feel like a retired Florida uh, a housewife <laughs> of some kind when I do it. But, you know. <laughs> so is that like, is that like for a hydration reason? It's not to get more out of the bottle though. It's, it's for hydration it's, or what? But all it's also just to make everything kind of go a little, for, like to, to just, you know, like, because to me, you know, I don't really drink much anymore. So it's more just, you know, to kind of make me feel like I'm, I'm well it, in the, in the before times anyway, that I'm part of the party, you know, <laughs> but I'm not really okay. drinking, drinking okay. that much. Got it. Got it. Uh, I wanted to remind our, our audience tomorrow, you're talking about uh, orphan wells, remediation, cleanup, wind, solar, hydrogen, nuclear. We're going to be talking to uh, federal minister of natural resources, Seamus O'Regan in this time slot tomorrow. So in uh, 24 hours from now, the minister will join us. Uh, I have to ask you this in close just because you brought up Grassy Mountain, um, uh, former Minister of Environment and Parks. Uh, what's it been like for you to, to, like every other Albertan, just be watching what's going on right now with coal mining in the Rockies and everything else? Well, you know, uh, uh, this is my constituents and, and billions of liters of water out of the river that flows through my riding. Uh, and uh, so, you know, you bet your beans that all through November and December when I was doing my, my end of year calling, uh, uh, to, you know, to, to folks that, uh, uh, like, that we've made a connection with in the past, you know, I made hundreds of phone calls and uh, people were just out of their minds with concern about this. This was before it kind of, you know, really culminated uh, or earlier this year. People in Lethbridge care about this issue. And these are the people that I re represent in the legislature. Um, and uh, we, we care about it because it's the, the water that comes out of our tap. It is the water that irrigates the crops that, you know, uh, that, that sustain a lot of the economic activity in Lethbridge, a lot of the, the knock-on effects of, you know, the accountants and the lawyers and the, uh, uh, the real estate market and the, the economic development initiatives, all of it, you know, uh, a lot of it ties back uh, to value-added processing and uh, primary product production in, uh, uh, um, in agriculture. So, there's no question that uh, uh, my my constituents really care about this issue. There's no question that uh, the government really balled this up, like, but good. Uh, uh, they didn't think that uh, Albertans cared about their mountains. I could have told them uh, that this was going to happen with all those ranchers and cowboy hats and the Indigenous uh, opposition that they have have uh, uh, run into. There's, there's no way uh, that this was going to go unremarked upon you know there, there was the grassy project which went into the regulatory process because it was not part of that coal policy and nobody was trying to pull the wool out of, over anyone's eyes you know and and the proponent had every right to, to enter into that process they don't have a right to an outcome they certainly don't have a right to a backroom deal for the water that comes out of uh, our taps in Lethbridge and, and elsewhere through uh, all of southern Alberta uh, they don't have a right to you know like uh, do some back slapping deal uh, uh, with the UCP and just be like, oh yeah, it'll be great. You know, you can have all this water that was supposed to go to irrigation districts or uh, uh, to keeping our, our watershed healthy through the old man. Um, but they do have a right to a process. Now, these other guys who want to strip mine the mountains all up the foothills and, and uh, all the way up into the Bighorn, they don't necessarily have a right to a process for, for open pit mining uh, because that was prohibited under uh, the 1976 policy, right? Um, and uh, in my view, I think the government has heard loud and clear that uh, that right should not be opened up. I'm not real sure why they need a consultation process uh, uh, for that. They've already heard from Albertans, but they're gonna try to paper up some kind of consul consultation process in, in you know, air quotes, um, because ultimately that's what they're driving at. They've clearly made some kind of handshake deal with these carpet bagging Aussies. Uh, and uh, this is what they think is gonna drive economic development in this province. I tend to disagree and so do the vast majority of Albertans, including uh, the majority of UCP voters. Yeah, for me, it was like, I mean, sort of lopping the tops off of our uh, Rocky Mountains is a non-starter, but if we were gonna, if Alberta was gonna take in a hundred billion dollars over four years, <laughs> 
I, I might be open to it, just to be honest. Uh, you know, I sort of think back to that movie, Indecent Proposal. You know, yeah. Alberta Environment could 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 flirt with something like that, maybe. But yeah, no. But the no promise. No, the, no the, that's that's the, indecent, Ryan. No, it's it's very <laughs> indecent. But the uh, but I mean, even the royalties on this, like, it's not even. I mean, maybe we would have a conversation if we were talking a hundred billion dollars. We're talking like pennies. I mean, like, it's like. It's not even anyway. I, I've well, got, I, and also, Ryan, go out to Elkford and Sparwood and go talk to the Steelworkers Union out there and talk to them about automation and what's happening in those mines uh, yeah. uh, with respect to automating their jobs out of existence. Right. I mean, the union guys will be able to tell you exactly what the kinds of dynamics that they are facing with metallurgical coal mines right over the border. Right. Yeah. Like this is that is real. So, you know, any of the jobs or economic activity projections that these com that the company has put forward through Grassy or, you know, as yet notional through these other, uh, you know, big holes in the ground uh, all up the foothills, I think have to be taken with a real grain uh, of salt as well. Shannon, uh, we've, we've kept you over time and uh, just wanted to thank you for your availability here. I know you've got a, a big day ahead of you. And then, of course, uh, budget drops this afternoon. We'll get a sense of what this government's priorities look like. Thanks for making time for us to tee it up today. Thank you very much. And that's Shannon Phillips, the MLA out of Lethbridge West. She's the official opposition critic for uh, finance, and she's the former Alberta Minister of Environment and Parks. Um, I wanted to give a shout out to Tracy on uh, our live chat. Tracy, as, as some of you are intrigued by this mug that I'm rocking today. Uh, and this is, this is, as mentioned, this is my everything's fucked mug. Um, I'm, I'm using this specially for Alberta budget day today. And Tracy gets the shout out. Some of you had wondered, I wonder where I can get that mug. And Tracy went straight to the source because she knows what's up. She says, I went to Carrie Skelton's website at carrieskelton.com. This is my wife, my better half, our family manager, Carrie's a life stylist. And, and Tracy says, it, it seems she's already tracked down the information. This is why it's intimidating to do a show like this. Not just because I'm interviewing people like Dr. Corey Mathewson next, who's going to make me look like a, an elementary school student with my scientific understanding of how the world works. Uh, not just that's not the only reason it's intimidating, but also because I know so many of you are, are on the ball. You're problem solvers, you're fact checkers. And Tracy says it appears based on her research at carrieskelton.com, the mug is from Days with Gray. And she is absolutely correct. And you can find Days with Gray online. Corey, in just a second, this is a great chance for us to remind you that the team at Grand Dog Essentials Quality Raw Food has three new supplements that they're adding into their food. If you're on Instagram and you're a if you're a dog owner, a dog lover, an animal lover, check out the Grand Dog Essentials Instagram page. It's about to boom. This is like what I'm able to say when I say, hey, I saw John Mayer in a lounge with like 90 people. I, I, that's my brag. I saw John Mayer when nobody heard of John Mayer before. This is you. You can say, I was following Grand Dog Essentials on Instagram before they had a million followers. It's one of the most educational Instagram accounts we've seen and our family loves it. There are three new supplements help protect uh, your, dog's al your dog against allergies and food intolerances. They can help your dog's digestive enzymes. And then they've got that green-lipped muscle oil. Uh, not muscle like, like you know, your, your pipes, muscle like out of the ocean. Uh, and so you can learn more under the Grand Dog website uh, and you can find it under the sponsors tab at ryanjesperson.com. Because we're doing everything up front and taking you behind the curtain, I'm just going to let Sam Brooks know the music in my ear is so loud. So next time we'll just drop the music down a little bit. It doesn't matter. We're problem solving, but no I feel like my problem. ears... Sam, my ears might actually be bleeding under these headphones right now. And if they are, I'm taking uh, you, you are into it, This is uh, when next time we go to a rock concert, Sam, I'm going to have to be the guy with those things in, you know, like the construction site things. in. I'm going to have to be that guy now moving forward. To be fair, I wear them at concerts because I do you. It depends where I am in the crowd, right? It's like if I'm right up front, I like to have a pair of earplugs in uh, just because it's um, it, just because it's like it's 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 dangerous to be that close to the main speakers without a little bit of ear protection. So uh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not surprised that you do something smart and responsible, Sam. That, that's <laughs> why you're, you're like the voice of reason on the program. We trust you with this. I can see Dr. Matthewson's actually nodding in, in, in our bullpen. He's nodding in agreement. So I'll, maybe we'll pick his brain on that too. I'm not going to have nearly enough time with this brilliant man. Uh, before we bring in the guy that basically had the entire province, the entire province, if you didn't know Corey before, the entire province fell in love with him yesterday and they're thanking him for saving the lives of their grandparents and their parents. I mean, the guy had like... I'm assuming, I don't know, his life's been pretty good to this point, but it's, it might be, might have been one of the best days of his life yesterday. 
yesterday. We'll find out in a second. Uh, so he's going to explain to us what he did. But there's a resource on social media. I want to show you this quick video, uh, another individual, and you're going to hear her voice. You're going to hear her talk about how brilliant this guy is and, and what he did and how smart it is. You'll hear it in her voice. Uh, but Sam, let's, this is the how to. So it's one thing. How did he do it? Now, here's how you can do what he did. So developer, JavaScript console, and you copy this code in here, which was from this tweet. And then this is what happens. All of this appears. Um, and basically um, what he did is like changed everything from to from display none to display block, which is basically, you know, visible. So I was just like, oh my God, that is insane. So now you go in and you can see all of this stuff here, which is insane. Fun times, eh? So Becca Gould is obviously a huge fan of Dr. Corey Mathewson. And I think about four and a half million other people in Alberta are as well. He's a research scientist with deep mind, He's a lab scientist with the Creative Destruction Lab. He holds a PhD in computing science from the University of Alberta with the Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute. And as he tells us, he's also a concerned grandson. Checking in from La Belle Province this morning, the beautiful city of Montreal. Welcome to Real Talk. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm, I'm, I'm so happy to be here. It's, it's wonderful. Uh, it's so exciting to have an opportunity to do this, really building it up. And, uh, you know, Becca's uh, voice, that reaction, I heard it once yesterday and then to hear it again is like, yeah, that was that really fascinated someone. And it shows how much of a team effort it was, right? Like I was, I don't know how to do that kind of screencast stuff with the voice and then get that like launched in a few minutes. So we all kind of came together and did our own part. Well, I'm going to be honest with you, doctor. Like when I saw when I saw the the uh, the tweet that you yeah. had released yesterday, I'm going to ask you what went into it and how you knew it was a problem, how you developed it. A bunch of people immediately started saying, "Jesperson, you need to get him on the show." Jesperson, you got to get him. And I'm going to be honest with you. And I told you this. I looked at it, and I looked at it again, yeah. and and I reached out to you privately, and I said, "I don't even know how to comprehend what you just did. I don't know how to describe it." I don't understand what's going on right now. All I know is that you basically changed people's lives yesterday. So in layperson's terms, can yeah. you explain the problem you identified and how you addressed it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, I, I mean, software is a complex thing. Code is complex, but it doesn't have to be, right? So, you know, historically, we haven't taught it in schools the way we should. And moving forward, I think a lot of people are going to invest more time kind of educating their families, their kids on how to program, how to code, how to interact with code. But for a lot of people, they see code and all of a sudden their brain goes into this like, oh, I don't know how to program. I don't know what's going on. But pretty much there's this thing called software that we all architect as computing scientists and we make it and we try to make it work as best as possible. And we, you know, it's it's a little bit different than a bridge or infrastructure in that you kind of deploy it and then people interact with it and then you have to update it and change it based on how people interact with it. And so the problem that we identified yesterday, um, it was actually my older brother who booked my grandmother in, then tried to book my grandfather in and the, the site slowed down to a crawl. And he said, why isn't this working? Uh, tried it again, tried it again. Then he called in the forces, called in his younger brother and, and our younger brother and said, okay, what's going on? You know, we've got web development chops in the family. We've been working, you know, building companies, doing all kinds of things to hone our skills in computing science. And we drilled down to find out that one of the issues was there was sort of this, uh, there was like a chain. It was like a chain of events that has to happen when you sign up on the form. And one of the links in the chain was slow. It was the weak link. And it was the slow um, kind of chain link. We took out that link and said, okay, you could just show everything that's on the form all at once. Like Becca was saying, if you just add a little bit of code, you kind of skip over that weak link and boom, everything becomes revealed and you can see kind of the whole form and, and move forward. So I wanted to, in, in describing you, uh, both in promoting your appearance on the show and my, on my tweet, yeah. I used the word hack. And then I said it again to Sam this morning. And I said, I want to be clear. I'm not implying there was anything nefarious or illegal or anything like that, but it's more like a life hack. Like when we say, here's an easy way to store duct tape or something like that. Um, but, but is, <laughs> is, is everything, is everything you did totally on board or like would people at, at, 
AHS, I've not confirmed this, but I heard that they said they contracted this out to tell us for, for web development. I don't know if that's true or not, but would these people be quite annoyed at you for what you did or is this on board? Um, yeah, I don't know exactly how, how their reaction is going to be. I haven't heard from them actually. And, uh, I, you, you know, I, I don't exactly know. All I know is that there was something that was hidden behind a sort of timeout. We were able to remove that bug in the code and show it all so that people were able to use it. Obviously, software is a complex thing and there's a lot of moving parts and pieces. Uh, you know, in terms of the development, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. And this was a pretty minor thing that probably only came up once a whole bunch of people hit the system all at once. So, you, you know, I. I don't know how their reaction is going to be. I hope that they, you know, take this, uh, embrace it and say, you know, we need to be able to scale to this amount of people signing up on the system as we grow to larger and larger cohorts. But uh, I, I would hope that they would be ecstatic at the number of people that were able to go through the system yesterday. Like if they saw the messages that were coming into my inbox, I'm, I'm sure they would be very pleased. Well, we don't even need, I mean, I, your inbox must be, uh, I mean, you should probably send your inbox to the Smithsonian from, from yesterday. Cause I'd love <laughs> to read it, but, but Corey, we pulled some and, and I want to, I want to get your reaction and, and feel free to talk your way through this with me as we put these on sure. screen. Yeah, absolutely. I, I want to I want to see if I can make you blush here, but these are some <laughs> of the tweets uh, when I pushed out what you did yesterday. I mean, I had a little fun and I said that this is proof that the private sector is better than government. Yeah. I said, you know, today's online vaccine registration debacle might be the most conservative thing the UCB has ever accomplished in yeah. demonstrating government should get out of the way. Anyway, uh, Justin chimed in. He said, to be honest, uh, just back for a second, Sam, he said, to be honest, this is closer to a comrade helping the masses overcome a solution uh, <laughs> poorly implemented by TELUS, a private company on behalf of AHS. And Justin's not wrong. But, you know, I mean, I, I asked Justin to please stop interfering with my attempt at humor. Um, <laughs> we went on and we, we started seeing messages like this. Zane Velji, a good friend of this show, Zane says, I've used Corey's solution to book for numerous seniors today yeah. who couldn't get through. I couldn't help but wonder if one of them was his mother-in-law, Alberta's lieutenant governor, but I digress. I don't know the, what age she's the, at. This is the amazing piece that I saw a whole bunch of times, you know, the, in, in that message that you just posted, people were going and booking two, five, eight, ten 10 people, all of the people over 75 that they knew they're the most tech savvy person in that small family unit, in that cohort, and they're spending their time. So, you know, if that form is taking an hour per person, then all of a sudden that's the person's whole day. So to reduce that time allows people to kind of, you know, push all of the people in their family unit through the system. Well, and there, there are people that, and this isn't just seniors, like I am among them. If, they, if we still used VCR score, I would be the guy <laughs> whose VCR was still flashing 12 o'clock the whole time. I guarantee mm -hmm. it. Sam, let's, let's make Corey blush some more because it's really important that we point out <laughs> What a difference he made in people's lives. Uh, Stephen Shapansky said, I just used this to book an appointment for a friend's father. Uh, this, this next uh, comment, and we'll just keep him going here. I mean, Brenda said, what a stressful, exhausting day for my elderly parents and family. Four hours finally got through to a home care office who booked for us. What a shameful debacle for Alberta Health Services. That gives you a sense of, of the stress people were feeling. How about this from Tootsie? He says, to you, Corey, thank you very much. I was able to book all six seniors in our family after trying all day online and on the phone. You are the best with the Double heart whammy there. That's for you. <laughs> what about this? M says, I used his trick after a thousand tries over hours. Say my 93 year old aunt got her shot in cameras. She waited more than an hour outside. She got cold. It got dark. But what could she do? She couldn't leave the line. She doesn't have a cell phone. This was outrageous for seniors. How does that make you feel? Uh, that's wild. That's wild. You know, the, the, yeah, just the, the these are some of Alberta's oldest people, just by definition, this is like the oldest. And that means that, you know, we're supporting them. We as a community are supporting them. So one of the things that is really resonating most strongly with me and how I'm feeling, talking about making me blush, is that, you know, how the, the age of people. So, you know, people would send me a message and say, thanks so much, I booked my, my dad and my mom. And I would say, how old are they? You know. Oh, they're 94 and 98. You know, the wow. oldest one was 99. Someone booked it 99. Can you imagine that? That's like, I've got two more full lives to live until I'm that person. I hope that there's someone like me standing up for me and my access to what I need when I'm that age. Um, also, the double heart whammy. That's huge. You know, I, you're not getting double hearts every day on Twitter. People, people don't just people don't just throw around double hearts willy nilly. No, no, like, no. You know, maybe maybe the thumbs up they throw around. I throw around the fist bump like it's I mean, it, like it doesn't take a lot to get the fist bump from me. But but the yeah. double heart, the double heart. This I means mean, a on. lot.
It this is amazing. Lot. Hey, now, the, one of the first things that I thought of, and Corey, let me tell you, I know that you work on a lot of important things and there's a lot of important things to discuss, but I want to get to the top priority uh, in my personal life. And that is the fact that we're experiencing great controversy in my fantasy hockey pool this week because mm. a guy a, a guy iced his, I mean, we want to hit real talk on real problems here, pal. <laughs> and and uh, a buddy of mine iced his lineup the wrong way. Now he's not technically wrong with regards to the structure of the pool, but he, he did it the wrong way. Yeah. You like, are you the type of guy that you just, you wouldn't even tell the other guys in the pool. You kind of go in on the back end of the website and just kind of change. Is this something that you do all the time? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's an interesting question, right? So like, I mean, there, there's sort of different approaches when you're working with software systems that in my opinion, totally unethical, you know, people are staking their time, their credibility, their energy, their money, their livelihood on their pool. Everyone better be acting accordingly, you know, acting with the utmost diligence and honesty and earnesty. So I would never stoop so low, um, to, to go in and modify any kind of stats like that. I mean, if, you know, if there's a system that is not working for people, we're trying to make it better for everybody. A pool that's competitive. You know, you got to be honest in competition. I, I mean, I was, it's, I was hoping that you, you know, your perspective wouldn't be polluted with things like <laughs> ethics and morality. <laughs> yet, 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 here you are uh, walking, walking the straight and narrow as you implement your brilliant. Hey, people are saying to me, people are saying the, the Matthewson brothers. They're saying mm. like you guys are apparently kind of a bit of a force of nature. Uh, did you wind up with bragging rights out of the, out of the? Is there three of you? You wound up with bragging rights yesterday because you're kind of getting. I mean, I wonder if maybe your brothers are going to start to turn on you. I mean, you're getting all the attention today. Yeah, yeah, and and it's interesting kind of how that works. I don't know where you land in the family order, but I'm the middle I'm the child. Oldest. Okay, yeah. there you go, there you go. So I'm the middle child. So this means that I have to do stuff like this so that people actually notice me, recognize me. Um, so the older brother Kai, he is a brilliant. Um, sort of neuroscientist, works at the University of Alberta, uh, a fantastic champion of understanding brains and behavior. The younger brother just recently moved back to Alberta, uh, a fantastic developer, has had a long career kind of building all kinds of web tech uh, for Edmonton companies, for Canadian companies. And, uh, you know, I, I do my best to hold it down in the middle. And, you, you know, it's amazing what we can do when we all work together. I think, you know, once the forces were all called in, we had this sorted out in about six, seven minutes. So like, you know, once you can assemble those dream teams, you know, we're not going to agree on everything. We, we don't know what we should all be working on day to day. But once it's like obvious, then we can really assemble and focus our efforts and make progress. Yeah, Corey, people that are watching this or, or that are listening to this pod, uh, you know, in days to come is is what you did. And people can find it uh, under a uh, Corey math is your your Twitter profile, uh, Corey, the K. Um, I've also retweeted it. People can find it relatively simply. Will yeah. your will your solution or your shortcut or whatever you're calling it, your hack? Um, is that still uh, I don't even know the words to use, man. I'm, I'm such an ignorant. Is it still live? Is it still does it still work? Yeah, I, I, I mean, at this point, I, I'm not sure. I booked my grandmother, my grandfather. I'm seeing people on Twitter reach out to me and say, hey, I booked my parents. I booked my grandparents. Thank you to Corey. Thank you to Kai. Uh, we really appreciate the effort. So I'm seeing a lot of the messages come through. I, I don't have a reason to go stress the system at all right now. So I'm not going to, uh, you, you know, push it. And I I hope that it continues to help people. I also hope that, uh, you know, the AHS uh, sees this and folds it in and then builds up their infrastructure in such a way that, you know, all the grandparents, all the older loved ones of Alberta can kind of be supported. But yeah, I, I imagine that these sorts of things will continue to be important as we grow the cohorts that are going to sign up through the systems. Yeah, very well said, Corey. Um, Lana's uh, watching right now and she, she sends me a message. Lana's just, she says he wouldn't be able to, uh, turn Bitcoin back to 300 bucks for just like five minutes, would he? Is, is that, <laughs> would you be able to help us out or? Yeah, no, that's like a collective, uh, yeah, we all have so to work together to change the hash rate uh, okay. or, or or do some kind of proof of work. Again, dis disappointing answer yet again from Corey <laughs> Matthewson here on Real Talk. Um, yeah. Can we, can we pick your brain just for, I mean, I'm asking you now, it's like, I'm, I'm, I'm asking like a, a, a neurologist, I'm going to say like, we have three minutes left. Can you please explain what it's like to operate on the human brain? Um, so I'm, I'm putting you in a bit of a tough spot, but, but you know, you, the, what you do for work and, and your passion and your calling, and, and we haven't even touched on the live theater yet. And your, <laughs> you know, your career as a performing artist, but, but you're a research scientist with deep mind and a lab scientist, with the creative destruction lab, you are your entire 
existence. I mean, mm. your entire job, every day you show up and you dream huge. You have to dream about AI and robots and where society's going. And you have to dream 200 years down the road. And then what does that mean for tomorrow? And like, can you just tell us about your reality, man? Uh, yeah, sure, sure. Um, okay, first off, Bitcoin's great. Uh, fully supportive, thinking 200 years down the future. Um, you know, in essence, I think my life is defined by the interface between humans and machines. So we as humans are going to interact with more and more intelligent machines. That is to say, you know, we start interacting with typewriters and fax machines, then computers. Then we start interacting with multiple computers. I don't know about you, but you probably have multiple computers around or near you right now. Um, that is probably going to continue to scale. You'll have more and more computers and you only have so much capacity to communicate with these devices. So we have to build ways to like interact with all these computers, all these machines at once that are natural to you, that are low effort to you, low energy, low intensity. And that is what I like to think about. That's my reality. I see us as humans using tools like computers, like AI, like machine learning in a way that augments our abilities, that augments our capacity, makes our memory better, our attention better, our social connections better, our communication better. Um, you know, at, at this point, I'm living in Montreal, I get on real good with Google Translate, and it works, and I can communicate at the level that I need to be communicating. And that is an augmentative technology that someone ideated on, someone developed, and then someone deployed, and now I get to use it. And yeah, so I think often about what are these friction points in society? What are these difficulties that we as an entire population deal with? What do we spend our time doing and what do we want to be spending our time doing? And then how does technology enable us to do more of what we want to do and less staying on hold, less, uh, you know, working with broken systems and online forms and antiquated tech? See, this is why the universe gives guys like you uh, the ability and the intelligence and not guys like me, because, because of how you describe how you implement your, your skills and abilities. And, and all I'm thinking about, again, is, is cheating in my hockey pool. And I'm, I'm trying to think of how I can, how can I stop slicing my drive on, on the golf course? I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of all that they're self-serving, they're selfish. They, they don't benefit anybody. No, 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 myself. not at all. Not at all. You're thinking about important pieces because, you know, like I was saying, the actual tech change that was necessary here was like six minutes. It was like one line of code. And then the hard work, the hard effort was in communicating it effectively, efficiently to people that are 70, 80, 90 years old or the people that are booking for them. That's you know, the majority of time, 10 times, 100 times as much time has been spent communicating effectively and walking the rest of society through this process so that they could book. So, you know, don't sell yourself short. You're focused on communication. You're focused on reaching people and, and getting the messaging to who needs to hear it. Listen to this guy. He's, he's encouraging people. He's building people up. It's amazing. Um, uh, first of all, we're, uh, we're, we're going to have to put together this already has it has to happen uh, in future a round table, a real talk round table with you and your two brothers. We have oh, to make yeah. that like that has to happen. I love um, that idea. Okay, That's so, fantastic. So, I mean, I, I would do that in like two days from now, but we'll we'll figure that out coming up. Let me let me close for now because I know that you you've got a, a day in store. And by the way, let me give you two points as well with our audience. Two points for you, Corey. I think you've already scored more points in an interview than anybody has. Sure. Um, but this idiot, me, uh, in producing the show, forgot first of all, overlooked the fact that you're in Montreal, forgot to mention the interview is mountain time. And at <laughs> two hours ago, you were ready to go. Oh, yeah. And so so that's so first of all, that's two extra points for you. And, um, you know, if we had something nice to send you in the mail, I would send it. Unfortunately, we don't have anything nice to send you right now, but you'll just have to take my word for it. Too um, bad. I mean, th those mugs are quite nice. The, the, I could I could get you I could get you one of these mugs. I think that, that, you know, we could get you one of those. And and as a matter of fact, um, I, I just got off. We had a we had I, I mean, I don't want to sound uh, too impressive here, to, to but oh, I, I was on an executive call last Ooh, night. Oh, my. Yes, I don't want to intimidate anybody here, but I was on an executive call last night. Is that like and a speakerphone? It's like it's it's very you probably wouldn't understand. Yeah. It's very technical. 
um, it's it's yeah, but um, but we we uh, we actually signed off on the design of our Real Talk coffee mugs uh, and and have ah. sent them along. Uh, and I don't know if I want to roll out the whole lineup of what we're releasing yeah, uh, yeah. In, in the weeks to come, but 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 we're going to make sure you get one of those. Uh, let me ask you this in closing. It's a question that most of your friends probably ask you um, after they've eaten a handful of mushrooms at a party, but <laughs> it's a question that I'm legitimately curious about. You may roll your eyes, but please don't. Sure. Do you worry that at some point? the robots are going to take over. Mm, mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, like, no, I don't. Um, hard line, no, but it's because we are working on tools. We're making tools. So we're not worried that like our toolbox is going to take over, that the screwdrivers and drill bits are going to take over. They're augmentative tech that we're going to use as best as we can. And it means that we have to, uh, you know, keep developing them and keep listening to all of society's needs and developing towards those needs. Like, no, I, I, I don't think so. I, it's, it's interesting to think about. It's a nice uh, vision for sci-fi. It's provocative. It's a real brilliant um, kind of aesthetic when you're building creative art to, to work in that space. And it's something that I've played with in some of the performance stuff, but no, I, I don't think so. Okay. I was just wondering, cause if, if so, I was going to, I was going to get in early on the robot side and <laughs> find kind of like find some personal security, maybe like sell out some fellow humans and just, but, but again, we're, we're driven by different ethical and moral parameters. So I, I think so, but you know, in a way, I've invested all my time in, you know, supporting these technologies. So I would hope if on the off chance, low probability that it did happen, they would look very fondly to me as someone who kind of helped develop them along the way. Well, I'll put in a good word for you, Corey, uh, and uh, and we'll see how that goes. Sam, can we, there, we left a few compliments on the table, a little bit of feedback here for Corey. And I thought maybe this might be a great way to close our conversation because we pulled even more. And Corey, this wasn't all of them. But so there was this one here. How about this from Vitor Marciano? He's the former senior advisor for, for uh, both Daniel Smith and Brian Jean at the Wild Rose Party. Vitor, a, a real political player. He said, this guy's my hero uh, and AHS sucks. That from Vitor Marciano, who knows a thing or two about how government works. How about this from Barb, who says, five hours of frustration. I stumbled across Corey's Twitter thread. I applied the fix in minutes. I had three appointments booked. How about that one? That's wow. uh, absolutely fantastic. I love this uh, this one here from Marla. Please thank him for me. I was able to book three seniors in my life for their vaccine today. Thanks to him. What about this from Sylvia? I tried for about four and a half hours to book online for my parents. Frustrated is an understatement. I began to search for solutions. After sleuthing on Twitter for about one minute, <laughs> I found Corey's instructions provided 10 minutes later. My parents' first and second appointments were booked. That's absolutely amazing. Uh, more uh, here, Matt says, oh, by the way, not to mention the guy's super funny. I always enjoyed the theater sports shows at the Edmonton Fringe. Um, nice. a, a lot of your fans uh, from the theater community were chiming in on this. I can't wait to get you and your brothers on the show, Corey. Uh, I love it. I, 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 you know, lower the bar, the expectation you've seen the best. Uh, so now at this point, there's sort of yeah. two more. Well, versions. I mean, that, that goes without saying. And I think once I, once I start to introduce like, okay, this guy's a research scientist with deep mind, people are going to go, okay, Jesperson's obviously kind of mailing it in today. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. know, just, but, but you guys can just be kind of the every man. I'll say, you know, we'll, we'll introduce you. We'll say, are you sick of, you know, you, you're everybody. We all hang around with our friends that transform the world and save people's lives and reinvent software and create the future of, AI and and people say yeah 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 but what do you have that's new for us right yeah and then you'll, right. you'll you'll have to find that angle okay I I like it and you know just looking at those tweets I just want to reiterate how much relief is behind each of them right it was relief in the moment that they didn't have to spend that time waiting any longer and it's relief uh, after a year of waiting that they get to do something that they get to take action and actually help support the older loved ones grandparents uh, moms dads in their families that uh, you know they've been waiting to take action on to help for so long I'm already excited for the round table with the Matthewson brothers. Uh, Corey, doctor, thank you so much for this. It's been, uh, uh, what can I say? A, a total pleasure talking to you. It's been awesome. What, what a delight. I, I'm so lucky and it's great to see you. Thanks for getting the message out to everybody. You got it. That's Dr. Corey Matthewson, a graduate, a proud graduate, uh, PhD out of the University of Alberta and Amy, that's the Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute now working for DeepMind uh, and, and obviously 
just an absolute beauty. So uh, I'm looking forward to getting him and his brothers on the show. I'll make you that promise. Um, the only way that that won't happen is if they say no. And this is how we apply the pressure. We put them on the record. Uh, we say we're going to ask them. And then if they say no, then that that's not my problem. OK, these guys. But oh, so Sam brings them back in. See, we're, you're on the record. I don't know what you're on the record. So. It's great. It's great. They're, they're, nothing else is going to work. You know, they, they need to hear the call out. And uh, I'm sure one of them would be more easily swayed. The other one's going to be the holdout. But uh, we can well, maybe we'll do maybe we'll do like a trivia contest or something or we'll do like a problem solving contest or to, to see actually who's the smartest. I love it. I love it. General trivia. <laughs> Okay. All right. That's Dr. Corey Matthewson. What an absolute beauty. We're going to hard transition to talking about beef. Yeah, beef. In just a second here, I'm really looking forward to our next two guests. Wanted to remind you that the team at Local Waste, proud partners of Real Talk, and they've been in business locally owned and operating in the province of Alberta for a quarter century. Now, the, you, you see all the big brands. They're owned by the multinationals and all these shareholders. And if you have a problem with the service delivery, you think you're getting a call back on the first day? Think again. That's not the case with local waste. They value their personal relationships and they love to talk trash. You can check them out right now at localwaste.ca and they'd love to compete for your business. Also want to give a shout out to the team at Clean Air Club. They want to make sure that your family, number one, can save money. Number two, can breathe easier. And that starts right now with something that you can do in less than two minutes. You go to cleanairclub.ca. You give them the size of your furnace filter. Let them know what you need. Next thing you know, they're dropping them off at your front door for less than you're going to pay in store. You save money. Your family breathes easier all at cleanairclub.ca. Also a reminder that the team at Park Power, proud supporters of not only Real Talk, but other community entities. You know what they've done? Ever since their inception, they've taken 10% of their profits and they've plugged them, they've plugged them back into the nonprofits in their community. It's their way of showing that they care about where they do business. They provide internet, electricity, and natural gas. You've got to pay for it. You're going to pay someone, so why not support a supporter of Real Talk? And here's a little extra incentive. If you go right now to parkpower.ca and use the promo code 2021-REALTALK, they're going to give you $70 off your first bill, whether that's commercial or residential. So here's the deal. We start talking about beef. I don't even remember how it first came up. I don't even remember. And I know real talkers, you'll be able to remind me. But the point is, several weeks ago, we started talking about sustainability in farming and ranching. I suspect it may have had something to do with the coal talk and maybe the water quality. And a listener wrote in and, and said, is there even really such thing as sustainable beef? Is that even possible? I mean, there's this just spin and so first, we reached out to Dr. Frank Mitloner at the University of California at Davis, at, U, at UC Davis, and, and, and it was a fascinating conversation. And then we had more and more people reaching out saying, you know, that there's, there's beef producers, there's ranchers that are doing incredible things on, on sustainability, on eliminating food waste. And they said, you absolutely have to talk to the two of them in particular, well, here they are joining us this morning. We're very excited to welcome to the program the general manager of Casco Cattle Company, Ryan Casco, uh, spearheads a family-owned cattle feeding and irrigated farming business located in the Lethbridge area. Jill Burkhart, her husband Kelly, and their three kids own and operate Crooked Lake Farm. Originally hailing from Montana, Jill has a degree in range management from MSU, from Montana State University. And uh, Jill's working with a program called Loop Resource that we're going to learn a little bit more about. Jill, Ryan, welcome to Real Talk, and thanks for making time for us today. Thanks for having us. Jill, we're going to get you off mute. I think you might be on mute right now. Ryan, we'll throw to you to get things started. When, 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 let, let's start with the very simple question. The listener wrote in and said, is there really such thing as sustainable beef? I imagine this is a question you love to take on. Well, of course, we think that we were raising sustainable beef. And, and to your point about, you know, these producers are doing amazing things. Um, I think this is just what farmers have always done. You know, we've, we've always taken care of our animals first. We, we want to do good things for the environment to take care of the land. This is where we live. We feed our, our kids uh, what, we're, what we're raising. So I don't think we're doing anything special, but um, I, I believe that we work hard every day to improve our processes, and, and I'm really proud of that. Well, I'm looking forward to talking to you about, about what uh, 
I mean, my, my relationship uh, between cattle and French fries has always been a very obvious one, um, but yours is a little bit different. And we're going to get into the details of how French fries and potatoes fit into your operation. Um, but first, Jill, want to officially welcome you to the show. We'll get into the into the, the, the Leap Loop resource program and everything else. But, but why don't we start by, by kind of laying a foundation here in talk about ranching and farming. How does sustainability influence how you and your family approaches what you do? Yeah, so um, we're the fifth generation here at Crooked Lake Farm, and the farm has been in the family since 1918. So that's our driving force. We are 102 um, years old right now, going on 103 years old here at the same location. And it's just been passed down all down the line. And so we're raising the sixth generation, and we want to keep our farm available for the sixth generation, the seventh, the eighth you know, and so on. We want to make sure it's there and that we leave the land better than what we found it. And I know that's a lot of cliche, but it's truly what we're doing right here. Um, we're trying to find ways to to make our environmental footprint smaller than, than what we've done, you know, than what they've done in the past. And not saying that those ways were bad. It's just with new technology, we have new ways to do new things now. Can you give us an example uh, right out of the gates of, of new tech that you've been able to implement and how it's changed what you're doing? Well, right now, um, we're sort of using, I guess we're using the food waste and we've used, and it's not maybe new technology, but compared to 50, 60 years ago, um, we're using, for example, a total mixed ration um, wagon. So we can take everything, throw it together in this big mixer, and that's how we're feeding our, our some of our animals right now. So we, you know, one of the, one of the conversations that we had that really lit a fire under our audience uh, was this story out of out of Portland, Oregon, uh, the Fred Meyer grocery store there for for reasons that, you know, I mean, a lot of people would say, hey, listen, you know, this is protocol. This is what the store had to do. They lost their power as part of these rolling blackouts and, and ended up putting what looked to me to be hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, worth of groceries at least into these bins. And it was just gut wrenching to see. I mean, even even you guys, I mean, beef, I mean, we're, we're seeing like racks of ribs and roasts and all these things. And I'm just going, Oh my gosh. And you know that there's families that are hungry, people that don't have income security or food security. It prompted a lot of conversation. It really upset a lot of people. Um, now, now Jill, um, right. As I'm about to tee up the question, I think Jill might've frozen on us. So I'm just going to wait to make sure that she can hear me. Um, but Ryan, in the meantime, why don't we do a bit of a hard transition? Why don't we talk about how French fries are working into your approach to farming and what you're able to do to eliminate food waste on your operation? Well, in Southern Alberta, that we're really fortunate because we've got some large food processing plants and uh, uh, some of them in include uh, French fry processors. And when you make French fries, there is, uh, you know, they'll take the, the peelings off of French fry. There is some of the, the uh, potatoes might not be quite right for their, their processes. So they, they kick them out the side door and, and we take them and we feed them to our cattle. Um, and sometimes during the production process too, like they might have a problem on their line where, you know, they've got French fries marching down to the pack packaging uh, process and something jams up. And so, you know, they'll just divert that stuff uh, out the door. And so probably for about uh, 11 years, we've been feeding um, French fries and, and peelings and, and uh, potatoes to our cattle. And it's fantastic uh, nutritionally for the cattle and, um, it helps make a more affordable ration for, for the cattle that we're feeding. You've supplied us with this video that is, uh, I mean, it's just absolutely amazing. I've really uh, kind of never seen, I love these behind the scenes looks, by the way, at, at how operations work, but I, I've never quite seen French fries served by the bucket full. I've never seen like a front end loader or a, whatever that is uh, <laughs> serving up fries before, but, but what, what is it like with, with regards to the quality of the beef that you're putting out? Does it actually improve the quality of the beef? Uh, well, I, I think it's, it's just a small part of a, our big ration. Like we'll, we'll feed cattle around 35 pounds of, of grain and silage. And then we've incorporated maybe around five to eight pounds of, of, uh, potatoes in their ration per head. Um, uh, so I, I, I don't know if it actually makes it a better product. It, it certainly doesn't uh, make it any worse, but, uh, it's more, it's providing starches to the animals. It helps them grow more efficiently. 
Yeah. And uh, one of the things I think is really interesting as well as the word upcycle uh, that you use when you, you know, you're upcycling what would be food waste, right? I mean, these, these French fries are, are on route to a landfill essentially. Right. And you're, you're, you're upcycling them into beef, which is a compelling story in its own right. No, oh, I think it's amazing. Like cattle are amazing creatures because they can take uh, food, you know, whether it's grass in the, in the fields that can't be eaten by humans or they're, they're taking uh, a byproduct of making food for, for humans and, and we can turn it into beef. It's, I think it's a win-win for sure for all of us. Uh, Ryan, I understand. Um, Sam, I'm assuming it looks, I'm, Jill's uh, frozen, not just sitting really still, right? I, I, just, I just want to make sure that I'm not going to throw that, it. I think she's frozen. That's correct. I'm, I'm working okay, with her on so, text. We've yeah, got rural so, internet issues. It's a, hey, hey, let's see an investment in rural internet in today's budget. That's what a lot of, I know what a lot of our, our producers, our farmers, ranchers, and our rural uh, residents would sure like to see that. Ryan, you've also, uh, my, I did a little bit of reading, um, sugar beets. You've been implementing sugar beets into what you're feeding your cattle. What, what does that allow you to do or what difference does that make? Well, you know, it's the, the same story. We have a, a sugar factory in Tabor that uh, processes a lot of uh, sugar beets every year. And at certain times there's uh, um, excess beets or they've got some problems in their production system. And for 50 years, the cattle feeders have been feeding beets. So as it happens today, we're, we're uh, taking beets from the sugar factory and, and uh, incorporating it into our rations. Um, oh, there she is. We've got oh, Jill, Jill back. Uh, Jill, welcome back. We're great to have, we're grateful to have you here. And we Sorry. don't sweat. Real internet hey, issues is, right now. <laughs> you know what? What, what uh, Ryan and I were just saying is that this is great. It's budget day in the province of Alberta, and we'd love to see an investment uh, in in rural internet, in rural high speed internet. This is this is proof positive why we need it, right? <laughs> I mean, you're trying to tell yeah. the story. You're trying to tell the story of Alberta oh. beef and the internet's not good enough. <laughs> so let's see people step up here. No. Uh, but Jill, I was, I was going to ask you. So, so I, yeah. I was teeing up that, that story out of Portland and the food waste out of the grocery yeah. store. And it was just making people sick seeing all this food wasted. I mean, whether or not you assign blame or whether it, that, that doesn't matter. I think we can all agree. It sucks when that much food is getting wasted. You've actually got, and I don't think it's just you, but a direct relationship with grocery stores. Am I understanding this correctly? Yes, yes. So I am one of approximately uh, 700 farms in Alberta um, that teams up with The Loop. And we, it, The Loop is all over Western Canada right now, as far north as Whitehorse and as far southwest as Victoria, BC. Um, so Farmers all throughout that, they work with hundred and about 163 stores in Western Canada right now. Um, not just the store that I work with, but other, other grocery stores. And what we do is each farm is assigned a day. And we go in on our assigned day and take all their shrinks. So everything that would have end up, ended up in the dumpster, we pick up. So that can be bakery, produce, meat, uh, deli items, floral um, frozen food and the grocery, like the dry good items. And so we bring that here. It comes packaged already by department. We bring it back here to our farm. And then from there, we sort it as to who can eat what. So this takes, uh, not, not to be Captain Obvious here, but it does take some extra effort on your part, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, so, so uh, you know, I don't want to take anything for granted. Why do it? Well, we, but we started doing it. We have a small, what started it all was um, I'm sort of an environmental person. I, I really care about the environment. I guess going into range management, I want to see grazing lands for cattle and not made into landfills. And so anytime I can divert anything from a landfill um, and so we can keep things out of landfills, um, that's, that's what I, I want to do. And um, so when I heard about this, I signed up and about a year later, um, I got, I was asked to be part of the program and initially started so I could feed my 20, 30 free range hens um, that provide just uh, some eggs for the family um, for cheaper because feed was costing quite a bit. And that's what initially started it. But then, um, and then we had a couple dogs and the, the barn cats and we're like, well, if we can cut their feed bill, then that would be amazing. Like, cause they were eating, like the dogs were eating about a bag or two a month and the cats were eating a couple bags of cat food a month and the chickens were, you know, so that's how we first started. But then some of our loads were so big. We're like, 
we can't feed this all to the, like we'd have chicken feed for a month. So we started Googling and doing a lot of research. And I'm like, well, in the States, I know they feed Krispy Kreme to dairy cows. So I'm like, why can't we start feeding some of this produce and bakery goods to the cows? And we initially started by feeding it to our, you know, just dumping it out on top of the hay and the, and then top dressing it with a little bit of grain to train the cows to eat it. And what we noticed was it wasn't the older cows that were eating it, but their calves. Because at the time we were starting to, we had, um, we were weaning and I sent you some pictures. And I think one of those shows a calf um, with a nose flap, a weaning flap in its nose. So they can't nurse. Um, and they were the ones that came for it. And cows have such a sweet tooth. They love the cakes that we got actually. So that was the first thing that they were drawn to. And so then we're like, well, cows eat green stuff. So we started feeding them lettuce. And then we're like, well, there's mushrooms out too while the cows are grazing. So we started feeding them mushrooms. And it just sort of snowballed from there. Bananas, oranges, um, gosh, what all do they get? Mangoes, um, apples. Oh, great what do they, what do they, they get? Citrus. What do they get picky about? What do they, what, what can't they stand? What do they leave there? Anything? Um, uh, not really. <laughs> Nothing much. They, they sort of, once we taught them, like we cow the calves, um, the weaned calves are almost like little vacuums when you feed them. Like I can hand feed them bread and they'll just eat it right out of your hands. They'll, they'll eat bagels. They'll eat, Oh, pretty much any bakery good you can think of like danishes like they'll do just, you think you hold your hand out <laughs> oh i remember this is like i mean as a city <laughs> slicker we'd go our families um you know six generations now on uh, uh well i mean there's a rich lot a lot of farming in our family but, but big dairy farm and i remember us city slickers us kids would show up in the summer and 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 feed the cows the long grass from the fence and they'd, we'd just get such a kick out of it and our cousins that lived on the farm would just look at us like good grief. But, uh, but it was all part of, it was all part of learning more, right? And it was all part of getting up close and interacting with the animals, Ryan, how much of what you do, or, and, and this is probably a personal thing. Every rancher, every producer is going to approach their, their job differently based on their perspective. How much of an onus is on you to tell your story, to communicate with your market, with the consumer, um, how, you know, to, I don't, I don't want to use the word defend the industry, but to act as an ambassador for the industry. Uh, does that, does that sort of, you know, is that something you think about regularly? I do, you know, and I, it's kind of a, an awkward thing. Cause if you, we're just trying to do our jobs and, and raise cattle and, and uh, uh, provide a living. But I, I'm finding that people are getting so disconnected from, from agriculture. Like, you know, you're, you're disconnected, maybe, you know, the, the generations going forward are going to become even more disconnected from what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. But people really care about what they eat. They want to know where their food comes from. And it's really easy to get uh, um, misinformation on, on what farmers today do in their operations. And so we've, we've really tried to uh, do a better job of bringing schools out for visits to our, our feedlots and, and, uh, Quite often, we'll have visitors from overseas bring tours through, and and uh, it's a great conversation. I think people appreciate um, the effort that we put into keeping our cattle comfortable and and healthy and and well fed. So it takes a extra work that we're not used to doing, but uh, it's been really rewarding to to have that experience. Jill, every uh, every um, is Jill still? Yeah, you're with us. Good. Every every industry is gonna you know, face disruption. And, and these are the time, I mean, heck, I, you know, I've worked in television. I've worked in, in terrestrial radio. I started my career in newspaper. Every single one of those industries is seeing major disruptors. We uh, in this moment are disrupting terrestrial radio, which is awesome. Uh, but the successful industries are the ones that find a way to adapt and to grow. Do you perceive things like, the beyond meat movement? Uh, do you perceive sort of some dietary trends from people that are saying, you know, we should eat less meat? Uh, do you, do you see, you know, sort of the, the big farming operations like the factory farms, are these things that you perceive as threats? Are they things that you perceive as opportunities to, to better message what you're doing? How do you perceive, you know, some of the trends we see and what people are eating, how they're getting their food, what general society is talking about? I think living in Canada, we're very fortunate that we have this battle, that we have the opportunity to have the battle between um, 
you know, vegan and this beyond meat and all that, that means that we're, we have that opportunity for that food. Whereas in, you know, say a third world country, they don't have that opportunity for food. They're struggling to even get food. So in my mind, I find having all these different opportunities is a food choice and it gives people, it gives people more options for food. Um, do I agree about, you know, that there's beyond meat out there that could be sitting right next to my a hamburger, um, my ground beef? Not really, but if, you know, it's a consumer choice. And I think if we get like folks like myself and Ryan, if we get our stories out there and tell what we're doing and the, what we're trying to do to help the environment and save the environment, then hopefully people will vote with their money for, for the choice that we feel is doing a better job. Um, you know, Beyond Meat is taking, you know, it, it, it is a veg veggie based or grain based um, a piece of piece of food, I guess. Um, I don't want to call it meat, but it's a piece of food there. And what we're doing on our farm is we're taking land that can't be used for farming. That land, the soil is not suitable for, for farming. It was maybe farmed in the 30s to the 50s. But what we're doing is we've reseeded it back to grass and we're using cattle, which is a better sustainable, um, a better option for that land, um, you know, then that land would be raising crops. So what we're trying to do is use is match the, the environment that is suitable or the type of land that is suitable, um, suitable for crop or suitable for cattle because we raise crops as well. Um, so we're trying to match the right, um, the land to the right land. Yeah. Um, the, the, we, we just saw a peek at your website at, at Cricket Lake Farm, and, and you can also find Ryan's Operation Casco Cattle Company online. Um, here, here's an interesting question. This is from Kay Lynn. I, I want to put this in front of the both of you. I'm curious to see how you'll answer it. Um, Kay Lynn says, you know, there's a big difference between local ranchers like these two and factory farms where uh, much, if not most, of the consumed meat comes from. Kaylin says, I'd be interested in their thoughts on what should be done about unsustainable factory farms. It's a question with an editorial bend to it. Ryan, we'll go to you first based on your facial expression alone. What do you think? Well, I think probably some people think I am a factory farm, but I don't want to take that as a, a negative. We, we raise a lot of cattle on our operation. Um, but we work really hard, like I said, to, to keep the cattle uh, happy and, and comfortable and well fed. And, and we work with a number of professionals to make sure that that's done. So we're, we do it on a large scale, but there is a reason that we do it. You know, we, we want to be environmentally sustainable. We also want to be economically sustainable. And um, what is the right size of a farm? It, it, realistically, it doesn't make sense that, that every single one of us is going to raise five, five or 10 head. And um, so it, it makes sense to concentrate, concentrate some of the production in certain areas. And, and that allows other crops or land to be used for um, wildlife or, um, you know, more natural animals. So I think what we're doing is, is, is right for the, for the world and feeding the people and, and a good balance. I love that's such a great question that you just asked. I mean, you could have just left that hanging and we could have just read what people would respond to you say, what's, what's the right size for a farm. Uh, it's been, it's been really interesting for me to see, uh, you know, different businesses that will start small. Uh, there's a, there's a hospitality group in Edmonton, uh, for example, I know the guy and it's, he's, he's second generation uh, restaurant tour. And they've employed hundreds of people through the years and, and they've generated millions of dollars and they paid taxes uh, for many, many years. And a while back, I saw people cracking on them because in the critics estimation, the family hospitality business, still family owned, had grown too big. It had become too successful. And so now uh, these critics were no longer going to support it. Uh, because there were the fledgling restaurants uh, that were struggling to stay afloat while this family-owned hospitality business continued to thrive. And I sat there and I still clearly right now, because I'm bringing it up in this conversation, I still wrestle with that. Like, where do we, where do we draw the line? Like Casco Cattle Company, for example, I'm not getting paid to say this, but you're family-owned, you're a family business. Um, I'd be interested to see, you know, people try to, you know, make this determination. When is a business too big? Uh, or, you know, when is a business not big enough? When does a business qualify for, for our type of support? 
Fantastic exercise, Ryan. It, it is a great question that you ask. Um, it, it looks like we may have uh, unfortunately uh, lost our other panelist, which is a real shame because I was about to say goodbye and thank you to Jill Burkhart. But, but Ryan, why don't we thank you? I know you've got to get back out to, oh, you know, running your family business. But thanks for making time for us today and shedding some light on things through, through the boots that you're walking miles in. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Appreciate it, Ryan. You got it. That's Ryan Casco, who does a great job. Uh, you can check out cascocattle.com, a Casco Cattle Company, a family-owned and operated business. And, of course, our thanks to, to Jill Burkhart, who joined us at Crooked Lake Farm. And you can check out crookedlakefarm.com. Uh, we're going to transition from beef to butter in just a second. H have you been paying attention to, to – oh, hang on. Can we bring her back in for a second, oh. Sam? Can we bring Jill in for a second? <laughs> This is great. Jill, we, oh, and Ryan's still on. Hi. Uh, uh, hey, we, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us and for shining. Some, it's, it's obvious that you care a great deal about what you do. Uh, Jill, did we, did we leave you hanging with anything that you're going to say, gosh, I wish yeah. I would have had a chance to make that last point. Is there something you want to close with? What I'd just like to say, I guess, is that, you know, what we're doing here um, is, I guess we're taking that food, we're feeding it to the cattle and um and to the other um but we're also if there's stuff that's still good we're also trying to get that out to charities that can use it as well for human consumption so as you said you know it pained you to see all those ribs and and all that food going into the trash can because what if some of it was still good um and quite often some of the food we still get is good so we're working with local charities to try to get that to people who need it still so it's not like we're feeding still good food to our cattle but we're also trying to do good by helping others as well well done jill thanks for taking time for us today we appreciate it ryan as well uh, there you have it two proud alberta beef uh ranching families and we appreciate their availability um I'm just dropping in on our live chat. I haven't been, I haven't been watching the entire developments. Uh, John L. Thanks for watching. John says, uh, Jespo, you should have a look at the Rome ranch, R O A M the Rome ranch in Texas. He says they're doing amazing things with bison to restore land that was basically destroyed by soybean farming. Grazing is a win when done properly. That's a great take. Uh, from a messaging standpoint, that's that's great. If 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 I'm working for for you know, Canadian ranchers or if I'm working for for the Alberta beef uh, lobby, um, if I can find something where soybean farming has destroyed land and roaming or bison is going to bring the land back, boy, is that ever a fascinating storyline, right? Uh, Dwayne simply makes the great point: Why are farmers always so good at what they do? because they are outstanding in their fields. Very well done, Dwayne. Thank you very much. Uh, in just a second, the legendary and fabulous Julie Van Rosendahl, who has blown the doors off a story that's gone international. They're calling it Buttergate. And literally this morning, when I was sending out my tweet around 820 Mountain, 1020 Eastern, when I let you know who's coming up on the show, I was trying to choose, I thought, which hashtag should I use for Julie? And I went to what, and the minute that I did hashtag B U and I started, I started typing out, but it just gave me buttergate. And I went, Oh wow. Like this is trending globally because someone, something is going, someone's messing with the butter and uh, Julie. Well, I'm going to let her tell the story in her own words. Uh, she's written uh, beautifully and wonderfully as she does in the globe and mail. I don't know if you're going to find somebody that loves butter as much as Julie Van Rosen. I mean, I'm, I'm obsessed with butter. Um, I'm happy to talk about butter for a half hour coming up right now because we can talk about the favorite ways that we enjoy butter. I mean, we can really get into this, but there's a problem first that needs to be addressed. And Julie's going to go there uh, with us. Dinner with Julie. You may know her if you're big on social uh, or, or you may just say Jesperson. Obviously, we know who she is. That's coming up in just a second. Wanted to remind you uh, right now, the team at St. Albert and Sherwood Dodge. Uh, not only are they your go to for the wildly popular Dodge Ram. As a matter of fact, they've been proud for, for more than 10 years to have the best selection in the province when it comes to the Ram 1500, the 2500, and then that big one ton bad boy. If you need to get some farming or ranching done, if we've got you right now tuned into Real Talk, you know where you need to go if you want to get your hands on a brand new Ram. But also if the family's looking to upgrade the daily driver, the SUV, the Jeep lineup in 2021 is a formidable one, including the brand new seven passenger Jeep Grand Cherokee. I'm driving a Jeep Grand Grand Cherokee right now, I'll tell you, bang for buck in the SUV market, nothing beats the Grand Cherokee. Go see the team at Sherwood and St. Albert Dodge. Also wanted to give a shout, as we head in to, a, to, a, to, to, to subject matter around dairy, 
it's quite obvious that this would be the appropriate time to remind you how proud we are to partner with the Dairy Queens in Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park, right? So the Chivers clan, they're big real talkers. They're huge supporters of real talk. And I got a message from Jeff Chivers who says, if he says, if I may, he says, my boys now are so obsessed with Dilly Bars. They say to Katie and I, when we're leaving anywhere, they've got little twin boys and then the older brother, Theo. They've got, they've got Theo and Nick and Charlie. The three of them gather at the front door and wish their parents a Dilly Bar day. That in the Chivers family right now, if you're wishing someone a good day, you're wishing them a Dilly Bar day. And my thanks to Jeff Chivers for wishing me a Dilly Bar day to all the real talkers. Of course, you can find Dilly Bars made with or without dairy at the Dairy Queens in Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park. All right. For those that know uh, Julie Van Rosendahl, she needs no introduction. Uh, she tweets at Dinner with Julie. Her Instagram is excellent. And at dinnerwithjulie.com, you'll be, you've been able to learn more about her take on, on what's going on in the world of food. She's an author of many cookbooks. She's a food columnist on CBC Radio. And I'm going to give the CBC a shout out, number one, because now I can, and it feels so wonderful and freeing. And number two, because Julie has broken protocol a little bit. And typically, you, you grant the CBC exclusivity. However, you have agreed to come on and speak with us. And I want to acknowledge how grateful I am. Welcome to Real Talk. <laughs> Thank you. And sorry, I didn't email you a bio. I was supposed to do that. You did an excellent job. You don't need to email me a bio because <laughs> when I introduce guests that everybody knows who they are and when currently, I mean, your report, um, your column uh, at the Globe and Mail, uh, you know, Real Talk, proud subscribers to the Globe and Mail, you, you've you laid this story out in an amazing way. So everybody's talking about the work that you're doing right now. Um, why don't we get into this? First of all, what we should probably do is you and I have a mutual love uh, and, and that is for butter. We're not getting into this to compete over who loves butter more, no. but this has been sort of a lifelong journey for you. I, I do adore butter. I used to eat it straight from the butter dish when I was a kid. I, I my mom would find finger swipes through the butter. I, I love butter. Like it's my go-to for pastry. I find, you know, ways to eat it on potatoes and toast. And it's like, everything has a vehicle for butter. So yeah, I'm a, I'm a butter enthusiast. You might okay. say. So what, and to me, I, I actually, this had nothing to do with, this was before Buttergate was even on my radar, but I was, I, I got into this conversation with some friends a while ago. We were talking about what did we eat as kids that we don't eat now? Or what did we have mm -hmm. in our fridges as kids that we don't have now? And one of the common things, one of the common answers was margarine. Um, yeah. we, were, we were talking about how everybody used to have a tub of margarine in their fridge, and it mm -hmm. seems like very few people have margarine in their fridge now. Uh, is, is that a win for butter? Why? What's the argument for butter? For sure. I think, I think a lot of people have switched to butter, the flavor. And, you know, it's interesting. My, my parents, when we were kids, we didn't have margarine. We had this concoction of butter and canola oil that my parents would whip together to make it more spreadable and, and give it a, a better balance of those unsaturated fats. And uh, so, yeah, it, you know, it, and it's interesting when I sort of dove into this, this dairy issue, the butter issue, uh, I spoke with farmers who said, you know, the, the dairy industry is very di driven by consumer demand. And 10, 15 years ago, even five years ago, people were ha eating more margarine, right? So there is less demand for butter. So the the, the consumer has definitely shifted uh, towards more sort of whole food, less processed. And, and I think that's part of why the story has exploded so much. Yeah. Because you know, we associate palm fats with, with processed food. It's, it's, very common in the processed food industry. Okay. So people that are you're hearing about this for the first time right now are going to go, wait a second. Sorry, what is spoiler. <laughs> yeah. You, 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 you were, you were just like, ahead. <laughs> so, so we encourage you to go check out this new movie, star Wars. And when you find out that Darth Vader is Luke Skywalker's father, uh, what you're going to think is, um, <laughs> So, but so how did this, so, so, so we know that the palm fats, we know we, we, you, yeah. you have identified the culprit, uh, but why don't we get to, to how you CSI your way into this? Where did you, where did you first determine, uh, here, here's the thing for me, Julie, mm -hmm. firsthand, mm -hmm. here's something everybody can relate to. You've got some toast. You want to spread some butter on it, but oh, you left the butter in the fridge and you don't have any soft butter. And I'm not even talking about people like you that might be looking to get into one of their famous pie recipes and they need that butter soft, right? 
Well, well, pot with pastry, you need it firm. And that's one of the I don't first know what things I'm I know about. is you, you actually don't in this case, but that's okay. <laughs> you, uh, you still eat it. So that's all that matters. But with pastry, that was one of the first places that I noticed it because typically I would, I would need to have fridge cold butter for the pastry to work it in. So that it's not greasy. So, you know, that it's not, it's not partially melted. You want the fat to be firm. And I noticed teaching a lot of pastry classes over the years that often the butter was just fine right from the countertop to go into the pastry, which never was the case in the past. Like it was noticeably firm, notice, firm enough to go into pastry, but not soft enough to beat into, you know, a frosting or a, a cookie batter. So as a recipe writer, I, I started to default to butter at room temperature. And then I started to rethink that because it wasn't soft enough at room temperature to, to go into to batters and doughs and, and things like that. So yeah, sorry, what was your original question? You talked about pastry. You don't even, you're the type of guest, you don't You don't need a question. I, I, I'll just I, go this, with it. It's why I've always loved, I mean, back in the day, I should let people know that you and I have been friends for, for. I mean, I think probably like almost 15 years, but certainly 12 or 13 years. And for we sure. used, I know, but you, we, we were like 17 when we started hanging totally, out. So, totally. so yeah, like we were, we were just kids. Well, I was um, 20, but yeah. You, you were 20 and, and I've, I, I'm obviously, obviously much younger, but, um, but Julie, you and I used to, have so much fun doing cooking segments in the kitchen on mm -hmm. breakfast television. And one of the things about, and I think I've told you this, it's a huge compliment, um, is that when, when Julie Van Rosendahl was coming on, I would do this much prep. I would do exactly zero prep because I would essentially say, and Julie Van Rosendahl's here. And then you would just take over and you would start, uh, you know, telling your stories and you've always been very good. So, so it, it doesn't matter. I don't need to give you any questions. So, so you start looking into this. And you're going, there's yeah. obviously a, there's obviously a problem with butter. So where did you start your investigation? So to speak, cause you've, you've really, to give you credit, like you and all journalists up in here and you've blown the doors on a pretty big story. I really did. It was very, I felt very Nancy drew about it all. And, uh, and yeah, you know, it's something that I noticed, but didn't think it was a thing, right? Just like everybody else. I, I thought it was just me. I thought it was my cupboards. I started to rethink how to, how to write my recipes but then people started tweeting about it like last year, early last year, sp springish, and and saying like, "What's up with with the butter?" And a couple people tweeted me and said, "Hey, do you know what's happening with butter? Why is it firmer at room temperature?" And I was like, "I don't, I don't know." <laughs> but I started noticing it. People were were talking about it on social media. Uh, I kind of paid attention through the the seasons, uh, and then earlier this year, you know, it. it had come up and and I was again it sort of kept popping up and I tweeted posted on Facebook Instagram Twitter okay what something is going on clearly enough people are noticing uh, do you notice there's a difference in the texture of your butter and I got over a thousand comments on Facebook hundreds on Twitter hundreds on Instagram like my Instagram DMs blew up and everyone was saying I thought it was just me my husband and I were just having this conversation. I was just noticing this. So clearly it was not, you know, limited to one region or one brand or, you know, a wonky batch of butter. It was happening across Canada. So, so I knew it had to be a bigger thing. And I had talked to my editor at the Globe and Mail and said, if something's going on with butter. I'm going to see, I, I'm going to see if I can figure out what's, what's up. And she was like, great. And, uh, and so I, I kind of sat down and thought, what are the obvious things that are happening here. And, and I thought for a while that it, it had to do with the, a change in the, the tariff rate quotas, the TRQs, which they had announced some changes to last August and it was over the long weekend. And I thought, hmm, but we get less than 5% of our dairy imported. It's a very protected industry. So it was too prevalent to be, you know, a, an increase in the, the dairy coming in, in my mind. So my theory was, Saturated fats are firm at room temperature. Unsaturated fats are liquid at room temperature. So it makes sense that what's happening is a change in the fatty acid profile of the butter itself. And so a higher percentage of saturated fats would mean it's more solid at room temperature. So I started diving into, uh, you know, livestock feed and the, the ruminant digestive system. It was, it was a couple of weeks ago during that polar vortex. Remember when it was like minus a hundred, especially up in Edmonton, it wasn't quite as cold in Calgary, but it was so cold. So I went out and bought all these butters. I bought French butter. I got grass fed butter just to lay them out on my counter. And I touched them like over the course of a few days, I would like 
you know, check and see what the texture was. I made some butter using some organic farm from Vital Green in Picture Butte. And, and the, the French butter and one of the grass-fed butters and the homemade butter were all noticeably softer than all the other butters. But even the expensive butters were firmer. Uh, so, you know, it was this, this fun kind of investigation that I, I included people online. I, I, I tweeted and posted my theory about the, the change in the saturated fat. And, uh, and sort of, you know, got people, people sort of got into it. It was like this mystery to be solved. And I totally got into it. So at one point, someone DM'd me on Instagram, someone I, I don't know, and, uh, and said, I, I worked in the livestock feed industry for a, a long time. And, you know, it could be dis supply chain disruptions. We get a lot of feed from overseas, like molasses and palm fats. And I was like, what, what, wait a second, P palm fats, like, Palm fats in livestock feed. That makes sense. Palm fats are very highly saturated fats. So we know palm oil and palm kernel oil. Uh, there are also byproducts to the, the, the palm fat um, processing. And so, so I went in that direction, started digging around in livestock, you know, livestock feed websites. It, they're very present in livestock feed and, and used as a supplement. The palm fat supplements uh, are marketed to dairy farmers to increase their yield and to increase the butter fat in the resulting milk. So the butter fat or the milk fat, the, the terms are interchangeable. That's, that's the fat component of the milk itself. So right now, it, the industry is very much driven by consumer demand. We want fat, we want butter, we're baking a lot. So farmers are needing to produce more fat. And this is a tool that's not new. It's been around for about 20 years in the Canadian dairy industry. And there are so many layers to this story. And this is why I really took my time. And I, I wanted to, to do due diligence. I didn't, you know, I've, even on Twitter, people were like, what's the, what's the scoop? And I, you know, I didn't want to spread any misinformation. Um, wanted to make sure what the story was before, before sharing it. So. So it's not new, but it's become more commonly used in the dairy industry as a way to meet uh, meet quota for butter. This is like you're blowing people's freaking minds right now, and I'm and I'm watching on our live chat, and you know, some random guy says, "I'm sorry." The mental image of Julie just laying out sticks of butter on her counter and touching them over the course of days is absolutely hilarious. Um, <laughs> Uh, this is great from Scott who says, is Julie like a chemical engineer? She should have an honorary degree for this story. But then you know what uh, several people are pointing out, which is true, mm -hmm. is if you're a great baker, I mean, let alone somebody that's like publishing cookbooks like you are and writing for the Globe and Mail and you're a nationally renowned commentator, um, baking specifically is all about chemistry, isn't it? I mean, yeah. if you can't get your chemistry, if you can't get your levels right, you're going to be a lousy baker. Well, yeah, and, and and it makes more of a difference. The fat component of baking makes more of a difference when you get into fancy pastries. So a lot of pastry chefs and bakers import their 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 butter. And I was talking to Giselle actually through Kevin Coswin. Anyway, we're all these. Hang on a sec for everybody else. So you're talking about you're, you're talking about Giselle who owns Duchess Bake Shop Duchess in Edmonton, Bake Shop, yes, which is like legendary. Around. Yeah, it, which is legendary. So so people like Giselle import butter um and these bakers who are really really finicky about their butter and get they want the higher uh percentage of of butter fat so european style butter i'm just kind of talking in a circle here i'm just making the edmonton connection and i love giselle and i love duchess um but but pastry chefs often seek out european style butter which is higher in butter fat so in canada butter has to have at least 80 percent butter fat or milk fat. Uh, the European style is usually 82 to 84 percent. There are Canadian producers that make that higher fat butter and it's typically more expensive. But in Europe, uh, the parameters are different. So butter has to be between 82 and 90 percent um, butter fat. So, so you hear a lot about you know people seeking out those fancier butters when they're paying attention to their baking. But yeah, at home, you know, the differences in the butters uh, is going to make a difference in, in your baking. Right. And yeah. So what, <laughs> like, ultimately is this like, is it paint a picture for those of us that, that, you know, sort of don't really, I guess what I'm saying is for those of us that have no idea what's going on most of the time, um, which is me included. Uh, what does this actually mean? Like now that you've done all yeah. this research and now that you've exposed the story and now that you've got literally, like I said, this was a lead story on BBC World News a couple of days ago. This is a huge, 
story. I can already tell you have something to say, so I want to just get out of your way. But what does this all mean for everybody? Well, speaking of huge, huge story, Jimmy Fallon made a joke about the firmness of Canadian butter last night. If it makes Weekend Update on SNL this weekend, what are I you, may are die. you just are you just going to retire? Like, what are you like, going to do? Like, what are you going to do from there? I don't even I don't even know. The New York Times. I talked to the New York Times today. Um, this morning. Yeah. I mean, it's just exploded. It was the number one story on the BBC for over 24 hours. So, but the interesting thing about all this, and I will get to your question, but everyone's saying, oh, Canadian, you know, Canadians are freaking out about their butter. And like, you know, Canadians have these butter concerns. I really hope that people in other countries start looking at the, the use of palm based supplements and, and feed in their in their own regions in their own countries and and already some food writers have reached out and they're starting to look into it uh, in the US in Belgium in uh, Australia I did the Australian public radio yesterday and and uh, and talked about so New Zealand here's another thing that I what you know as I was as I was researching this uh, I came across a product called PKE which is palm kernel expressor or expeller and it's the crushed leftover kernel um, that's left after the palm kernel oil is extracted. So it's used as livestock feed in New Zealand. New Zealand is by far the biggest dairy exporter in the world. Uh, they import a lot of their livestock feed and the number one imported livestock feed is PKE. So they're really close to Indonesia and Malaysia, which is where most of the palm production happens. And, and so of course, you know, beyond the concern about the texture of the butter and our ability to spread it on our toast, there's concern over the fact that palm products are present in not only butter, but in dairy, right? The focus is on butter because it's showing up in the texture of butter, but it's in the, the milk and the cream. And so, so PKE is very common uh, feed, a, you know, a palm byproduct in a different form. Uh, and, and it's something that, you know, typically we can look for on a package label, we can look at the ingredients and say, you know, there's palm kernel oil, there's palm oil, there's, palm, you know, there are palm products in this, uh, but we can't do that with with butter, right? Or, or dairy products. The butter is an ingredient. We're not used to looking at the ingredient list. It's it's sort of a basic ingredient. So that's I'll be well said. You know, and, and that's, yeah, it, it's, and that's sort of the, the, the crux of a lot of this is, people don't think what's what's in my butter or what's in my my milk or my cream it's butter or milk or cream so so i'm curious moving ahead from here and i think this was kind of part of your question that you just asked me <laughs> oh i don't even know i don't even know what my question I, I who cares who cares what my question is i just care about your answer i just care about what you're saying but just but, talk but you're you're so right julie because when we think about i mean you know we should think about i mean we keep in mind we're coming from a conversation about feeding beef cattle, Krispy Kreme donuts and French fries and silage and um, uh, shrinkage from grocery stores and, and all this kind of thing. And then we're, and then we're coming right into a conversation with you about this. And it's just such a beautiful um, sort of evolving conversation that we're having, anyway. but, but, but how much do we think about what dairy cows eat and how much do we think about how butter is processed and how much do we actually know about it? And the reality is really, not a lot. Uh, it's no. great to see that uh, Joanne Uchuk is is watching, another good friend of mine. And uh, Joanne uh, has a great business, Fine Frostings. She knows her way around baking, let me tell you. And, and Yeah, and she says, this makes a huge difference in my buttercream icing. She said it splits all the time, and it's been really difficult to work with. People are going to have all different kinds of ways how this is affecting them, right? I mean, once yeah. this starts messing with, with my homemade fettuccine Alfredo, I'm... I'm <laughs> No, I, was gonna say, I was going to no, say, pi- I was going to say pitchforks and torches, but torches are getting a bit, of, that's a bit of a loaded statement these days. So maybe I'll, maybe I'll steer clear of that. But let me just say, I, as a, as a good Canadian, I'm going to write a strongly worded letter. If my uh, fettuccine Alfredo starts to take a sideways turn on, on this um, people, people might wonder why palm oil is, I, I'm, and I'm reading in, in pre- preparation to talk to you, Julie, um, not every nutritionist, not every expert will crack on palm oil. Mm-hmm. with regards to the, the the impact that it can have on the human body. As a matter of fact, it's not the worst. Mm-hmm. However, the environmental impact, what I've learned uh, about palm oil is very significant, that these trees mm-hmm. take about 
25 to 30 years to mature that when they get too tall, they're lopped down to make room for new trees. There's a deforestation issue. Uh, a lot of vulnerable species, I've seen orangutans in particular and others named, their habitat is being drastically uh, impacted by, by the farming, the harvesting of palm oil. Um, I want to make sure that our audience and that I have a balanced perspective on everything. Mm -hmm. So all things considered with this remarkable journalistic exercise that you've undertaken, um, where do you kind of wind up on this whole thing? I mean, you've talked to, I, I know that you've talked to dairy farmers, you've talked to people within the lobby, you've talked to people that use the butter. Um, have you, have you formed kind of your final opinion here or is this still a fact finding exercise for you? Well, yeah, this is the the interesting question, and 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 industry has made some moves in Quebec. Uh, the dairy farmers made made a statement about reducing the the, the palm fat. The and AgriPure, so AgriPure is a huge uh, uh, company out in Quebec, and uh, you know representing over three thousand farmers. Um, they made a statement yesterday, you know, asking that the farmers stop using palm supplements. Um, so, you know, the question about, about banning it outright, you know, that's a question, uh, to follow up with the CFIA, um, technically from what I can tell, it falls under the, the, the vegetable oil, um, category of approved livestock feeds. And, you know, it, if it's approved as safe in, in, for human consumption in human feed, um, you know, they're going to have to do some more looking into how it affects the, the milk. And so, whether or not they're going to make a, a ban sort of across the, the board, I, I suspect that won't happen. Um, it might. I think what's going to happen, what's going to have to happen, or what's starting to happen already is the industry and, you know, creameries, um, dairy producers are going to start to communicate with their customers around their policy on um, palm fat supplements in the dairy feed. So, so when people, you know, ask because that's the only way to know right now. Uh, Grass-fed, there are new grass-fed protocols that uh, the Dairy Farmers of Canada are rolling out. And, and under those protocols, any you know, uh, product, butter that, that has grass-fed on the label cannot be fed any fat supplements at all. Um, there's a lot of talk about, you know, why not use canola oil as a fat supplement? But those high omega-3 fats actually have the opposite effect and they suppress the, the butter fat production. So, um, yeah, you know, one nutritionist I spoke with in 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 Alberta, dairy dairy nutritionist, uh, said that there have been supply disruptions when it comes to the palm supplements. So some of the livestock feed companies have less to send out to their customers. So we may see a, a dis from the, this disruption a, a reduction in the amount going into the feed, and maybe uh, the farmers because of this consumer awareness and and. Um, because consumers are starting to ask about it, maybe they will start to sort of wean it out of their their use. Am I making any sense? I haven't slept. Yeah. <laughs> you're doing great. What are you talking about? Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, no, I, this is, no, you're fantastic. It's great. It's 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 fascinating. I mean, I'm just- It is. I guess what I'm trying well, to decide is if I feel like, and, and, and maybe yeah. I'll, I'll put it to you in the form of a question, is if this was kind of like, did- like did dairy Ugh. producers kind of try to pull a fast one on people? Like, is, I, I guess that's what I'm asking. Is this, is this a bit of a, like, did they kind of get caught a little bit and now the public's kind of going, Hey man, WTF, like, is that. No, you know, I, I feel like there's a lot of um, sort of mudslinging and, and, and suggestions that this is a nefarious practice. And I, I get the sense from talking to a lot of people in the industry and farmers that it, you know, it sort of started, gradually um the 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 rations have increased and that's a factor too you know it was sort of a gradual increase and now the the scientists the researcher that i that i've spoken with have said that they see a correlation between the the higher rations and the palmitic acid in the resulting milk so i i feel like it's sort of this gradual thing that kind of started as you know it's a tool that that farmers use to meet their quota and with the reduction in the number of cows the cow population has dropped um, from year to year in canada since about 2014 and there was a larger cull last spring and this is another part of the story i have no idea how much time you have so i'm sure you'll we have all the time in the it. world Julie. oh yeah yeah so so in the spring uh there is a larger than usual call in in the dairy cow industry. So so to connect with your your further cattle conversation, 
over 200,000 dairy cows in Canada are culled every year for various reasons, mastitis, reproductive issues. Uh, a lot of them, the majority are unknown. Um, those cows that are culled go to the beef market. Uh, there was a larger than usual cull last spring because of the pandemic, because all the schools closed, all the restaurants closed, you know, a lot of institutions closed. So you mean, cause all- it's, it's, it's expensive to keep them alive. Exactly. It's expensive yeah. to keep them alive. You can't, I remember talking to ranchers and farmers that were yeah. saying like, what, what people don't understand is like, if you're a beef rancher and you say, well, the beef prices are really low. And then you say, well, why would you send them to slaughter then if the beef prices are low and they're sitting there going, do you understand the, the, the cost yeah. implications of feeding? I mean, we were just talking to, to beef ranchers half an hour ago that, that off the, if I remember correctly, I think they said that they're feeding their their cattle, each, each, each like 35, they said 35 pounds of, 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 of something like whether, whether it's like whatever <laughs> they, <something>. <laughs> well, <laughs> hamburgers, I'm not going to, I'm not going to pretend like I know what the hell I'm talking about, but yeah. you know, like, you know, like the, the, the typical feed, the standard feed, whatever the, the mix would look like mm-hmm, based on mm-hmm. the operation, whether that's silage or, or whatever, yeah, yeah. you know, so they said about 35 pounds of that and about eight pounds that's of fries. So I'm sitting there going like each animal is eating 45 pounds of food a day. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and if and if you have hundreds and hundreds of animals, uh, the reality is, I mean, sometimes as human beings, we don't like the reality, but the reality is uh, you, they got to go. Yeah. Yeah. So they they culled a lot of the uh, and I, I wasn't able to get a, a number, a solid number, um, but the the Canadian Dairy Commission did confirm that there was a, a, a larger than usual call last spring. Uh, and. So then that, you know, reduces the number of cows in Canada, followed by a surge in demand, right? So, so farmers ultimately have to meet their quota and the palm fat. So, so your, your question, you know, is this sort of the, the dairy industry trying to pull a fast one? It's, it's something that's been there for a while that's increased in use. That's very contentious in the industry. You know, a lot of, a lot of farmers, a lot of people in the industry uh, said that they, you know, would talk to me, but they didn't want their name associated with right. it. Um, you know, so, so that's another reason I've been very sensitive about it. There's another reason I, I haven't used the Buttergate hashtag because it seems to be, <sighs> I don't know. Are you calling me part Disrespe- of the problem? No, 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 no. I mean, it's turned into this big thing, but you know, early on, I just, it seemed almost disrespectful. Um, a lot of farmers have said, you know, everyone else is doing it. And if the milk is pooled, everyone else is doing it, then, you know, it's hard to, Sorry, we're, sorry. We still got you. We're good. We're good. We're good. <laughs> let me. Well, let me ask you about this because this is a. That was this a New is, York Times, by the way. <clears throat> you, you, if you, if, if so, <laughs> our marketing. I'm, I'm trying on the fly come up with our marketing, like real talk. You'll hang up on the Times for us or something like that. So this is great. We can say Julie Van Rosendahl of the Globe and Mail, the New York Times, and Real Talk. This is <laughs> yes. this is this is your trifecta. But let me As ask her- you this. And, and, and I only asked you, I, I, I mean, we told you we'd let you go four minutes ago. So no wonder the New York no, times no. is calling it. We're going to let you go. But, but um, this is, this is, this is serious business. I need you to explain this um, to me and to our audience, because I'm going to be honest, I've not done the digging. I don't even know what this is about. However, uh, Sylvain Charlebois was on the show a while ago. Uh, Dr. Charlebois, not, not talking about butter, not talking about this. Uh, but he's the senior director at the Agri-Food Analytics Lab at Dalhousie University. Sam, if you could pull up his tweet for me. Um, he says, he tweeted, this is this morning, he tweeted, Dear dairy farmers, I've received threats from dairy farmers for more than 20 years, but this is 2021, enough. I received a threat last night again, and I decided to report it. Personal attacks and character assassination is unacceptable. Please stop. What's he talking about? I don't know. <laughs> I Hon- you that. honestly don't know? I honestly don't know. I have had no pushback from the industry. I've okay. had emails from, I've had, I've talked to the Dairy Farmers of Canada, the CDC, the the Food Processor Association. I've talked to so many people. I've talked to so many farmers, uh, people on dairy marketing boards. I've only had emails from people saying, thank you for bringing this conversation to light, for d- doing... Uh, such a balance for such a balanced approach. I honestly have not had any threats, any pushback at all. But you talked to in the you talked to Sylvain, right? Yes, early on. Yeah, I told and him. So, I because let him I, know my. Yeah. I've got a message here from a from a dairy farmer that I'm not. I don't. I don't know that they want to be identified. So I'm just going to yeah. respectfully just. I'm just not going to identify the, the producer. But it's a it's a high profile dairy producer. Um, 
that says, um, you know, this is no longer a story just about dairy and how or why we choose certain feeds. Sylvain Charlevoix is pushing the limits of irresponsible journalism, which is. Oh, I got to look at that. Okay. So, so, Sylvain talks a lot about supply management and uh, the economics. I'm sure he's he's likely talked about um, the taxpayer subsidies in the dairy industry. So he sort of he did an opinion piece in the Globe. And okay. Speaks more to that sort of things. So yeah, I haven't honestly my my phone has exploded. I have not kept up with all the social media. It's just crazy. But yeah, I'll I'll take a look and see what's uh, what's going on. Isn't it exciting though when you're like. When, when something like this happens, it I mean, do, right? Yeah, it, I mean, and it was very like I don't. It was a great learning experience for me, you know, to talk to so many people and, but just to, just the fact that that little nugget sort of like unfolded into this into this thing that uh, people are you know, responding to all over the world, and yeah. hopefully looking more closely at you know, their food systems and our food system as a whole. And, you know, food literacy is so important. We're so disconnected from h- how our food is made and how it's raised and how we play a role in all of that, right? As consumers. So consumer demand, like I said, is driving the 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 demand for butter fat. That's what's causing the farmers to, to need to produce more butter fat to meet their quotas. And now consumer demand is going to be some clarity around what's what's in the feed that's some clarity milk. some clarity come oh, on oh that wasn't even intentional <laughs> oh very very well done my friend um hey julie uh, i i know you, you actually seriously do have to talk to the new york times so i just want to thank Sorry. you for your time no <laughs> you don't have to apologize for talking to the the the, uh, the 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 western world's newspaper of record thank you for making time for us into overtime this morning it's always like your face just makes me smile it's great to see you Aww, again keep you up too. the great work at dinnerwithjulie.com Thank you. You got it. That's Julie Van Rosendahl. Uh, she's a, a, a food columnist for the CBC. She obviously is a food editor for the Globe and Mail, does amazing work in it. And it sounds like you're going to be able to read uh, that. There you see it right there. Thanks, Sam. That's dinnerwithjulie.com. Uh, hip to be square. Very well done. Check out some of her recipes there. She's been doing a great job. Um, you can let me know what you think about that conversation. I mean, if I'm, if I'm in the, uh, you know, if I'm in the dairy lobby, I'm going to say that there are there's some messaging that needs to happen here that they're going to want to get ahead of. However, the good news is, is that everybody cares about butter. I mean, that's obvious. Um, now I'm feeling like everything is metaphors for butter, but it's a softened approach to talking about the budget. The government's talking about uh, lives and livelihoods. Um, you know, it's it's a narrative. It's you'll notice they're not using the premier's voice in the television and radio advertising that they're purchasing. Um, strange that they haven't purchased advertising on Real Talk, isn't it? You'd think they'd want to reach Albertans on the most listened to podcast, but I digress. Having a little fun with that. Messaging obviously is big when it comes to government policy. What about what we what we saw from our remarkable talent here? I mean, when we talked about Alberta Health Services and the vaccine registration, the online registration for for, for yesterday, Dr. Corey Mathewson joined us from, from uh, DeepMind, uh, just a brilliant guy. Uh, what about the messaging around that? Where, where did this fall apart yesterday? Uh, a huge part of it, obviously, traffic capacity on the website couldn't handle it. But messaging, talking to, to people concerned about seniors, talking to seniors themselves, communicating about some of these issues they're encountering, messaging would have gone a long way. Why do you think our beef ranchers wanted to be on the show today? Messaging. They want to be able to provide their side of the story. Now, there are going to be some of you that are listening, that are watching us on YouTube, that are going to check out the podcast later, and you're going to say, ah, you know, the, the beef lobby, I don't, I don't see eye to eye with them. I think we need to talk about, you know, getting off animal proteins, period. Uh, you know, it, it's why we asked them. It's why we asked Jill Burkhardt or asked her about Beyond Meat and the vegan lifestyle and trends that they're seeing. And communication, again, it all comes down to communication. It's the bedrock upon which this show is built. Why don't we communicate on behalf of a couple of our partners right now to let you know what they want to make sure you know 
Kubi Energy, of course, in addition to providing the sponsorship for Positive Reflections every Monday, it's where we tell the stories from Real Talk viewers and listeners that'll get your week started right as submitted to talk at ryanjesperson.com. Kubi Energy also, of course, providing solar installation services and great advice for people in British Columbia and Alberta. If you're considering going solar, if you want to take a look into what it might mean for your home, if it's a good fit for you or your commercial operation, then you're going to want to give Kubi Energy a call. You can find them online at kubienergy.ca. Don't forget, they handle the paperwork for you. So if there's a if there's a rebate to be had, if there are permits that need to be secured, they do all that work on your behalf. The team at Friesen Brothers, boy, you want to talk about Alberta beef? <laughs> you want to talk about Alberta butter and dairy. You want to talk about Alberta pork and turkey and chicken and Alberta milled flour and when they can get it, Alberta grown produce. Friesen Brothers for more than 60 years has built its brand, this family owned and operated brand on being Alberta grown and Alberta owned. And March 5th, they opened their brand new Edmonton location. I feel bad for everybody else in the grocery game in Edmonton because Friesen Brothers is about to own it. The minute you walk into one of their stores, you'll never look back. I guarantee it. It's where my family shops at Friesen Brothers. Also, a big shout out to the team at Westworld Computers. You know, we're doing this show from two locations. Sam's running it in studio, the Real Talk studio with his big, sexy iMac. There he is on camera for Sam. I miss you, pal. I miss you, buddy. I miss you, too. I will say the studios never looked so clean and tidy and or i mean we we maybe need to get a coat rack that we, we could class it up a little bit with a coat rack other sam you you've, you're holding down the fort so beautifully and wonderfully with that imac i've got two of the macbook pros in front of me i got my iphone my ipad i mean we got all hands on deck here when it comes to the offerings that you'll find at westworld computers they can help you find your solution to your needs there again another family-owned business i love the dynamic of our real talk builder base westworld computers for more than 40 years provide services on all the latest products that you need. Sam, it's it's been a day where we've kind of bounced around a lot and talked about a lot of things. Um, I know for you personally, that story yesterday of, of the vaccine registrations and the process was one, this was one that, that uh, and I hope you don't mind me bringing it up, but this was one no, that impacted your, your, your family was one of those families that that was it left in limbo a little bit. Yeah, and I I, I sent you a, a text from my mom yesterday, and I, I kind of talked about it a little bit off the top because you're just like, oh, you're excited. And I was like, well, I'm relieved. I'm relieved. And, and Corey Matthewson actually talked about that a lot. Like, remember when he was you were going through the tweets and he said, like, the theme to all of these is relief. These are people that have yeah. been waiting, waiting for a tangible something they can do to help the seniors in their lives for a year. And this thing finally came up. And so, yeah, I got this. Uh, it, it's interesting. I get this text from my mom. I forwarded it to you saying like, I have permission to read this on the show. Well, if can, you want, but... can you read? Do you mind? Cause I think sure. that this is, I mean, this is, here's this is the thing that context. I think yeah. this is what really resonates with people. This is a real life story that affects real life people, including uncle Sam and his family. So uh, I just think it's another testimonial. All right, so from my mom around uh, 8 p.m. yesterday texts me and says, Sam, thanks for letting me know that the vaccine booking thing was all over the media today. I went on Twitter, stumbled across the post where someone had discovered that the HS booking site was timing people out in 10 seconds, which, of course, was our guest, Corey Mathewson and his sleuthy brothers. Uh, I wrote the instructions for people to and, and wrote people the instructions for people to reset their Chrome uh, while dad was in the yard. Like, I got to remind you, he, my mom was also attending to my grand... My, one of my mom's brothers had to take my grandfather to the ER yesterday because he's been having some some blood thing, thinning issues. And so she was at my grandparents' house making sure that my grandmother was okay. Uh, it's a very all-hands-on-deck thing with the family right now, and they, they get a lot of home care. But anyways, sent the instructions to uh, one of her other brothers. One of my younger cousins was able to read through it, and he says... Uh, implemented the instructions. Now, granddad and grandmama are being vaccinated next week. I am weeping with utter joy. And I'm then weeping I, with utter joy. I further went on to say to mom, it's like, wow, do you mind if I read this on the show tomorrow? And she said, go right ahead. He's a hero in my books. Wow. Look so at there that. There you go, hey? Corey. Straight from my mom. I think, I think considering that we're talking about getting seniors vaccinated and dairy, we could just title the show Utter Joy. What do you think? I mean, that might be. I wanted to wait. I wanted to wait to deliver that because you were drinking coffee over our audio board, which isn't cheap. And I thought, you know, I thought, I thought maybe I better wait uh, to deliver that one. But I think yeah. we might be onto something there. Well, well done. I'm the, thrilled to hear uh, about your family. The, I, I texted you this yesterday too. I was looking at 
uh, cause you, we have a shared calendar where you put the segments in and, um, later this afternoon I have a blood donation. So my, my schedule today is beef, butter, blood. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's great. I love it. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to, and, and, and so Corey's work helped people, uh, book in for their vaccinations. You could do bookings and then, and then Shannon Phillips was on budget. About budget. Oh my God. So butter budget bookings, bookings beef. But butter and blood, uh, the the blood at the end um, <laughs> requires a little context, but uh, that's great. And, and good on you for for donate. There's so many themes woven in through this. You know, good on you for donating blood. You know, I still I still cannot donate blood. Oh really? Because yeah, because I lived in the I went to college for a year in England uh, oh, in yeah. nineteen uh, yeah ninety five ninety six right when uh, mad cow disease was a big deal over there. And uh, as a matter of fact, um, and I've checked in with Canadian Blood Services over the years, I typically check in once every couple of years. Um, and I still, which is a really weird feeling when when a, a, a health body um, notifies you that because this could still be, and I'm not using technical terms, obviously, but mm. it still could be, you know, dormant in my body um, that I still, that was 96. So what's that? 25 years ago. Boy, yeah. I'm old. 25 years ago, I still cannot donate blood. It's, it's uh, yeah, really. And that's, that's interesting too, because like every time I go, you have to fill out the questionnaire and, and, you know, have you lived in, in the UK during this time is always yeah. one of the questions on it. Um, and, and it's funny because like, you know, to a person that that doesn't affect you just kind of gloss over those questions. But, you know, I have to keep remembering that it actually is, does, uh, you know, exclude some people from the system, unfortunately. But uh, Tracy uh, yeah. D says, Tracy D says that could be a great restaurant name, beef, butter, and blood. Um, maybe I'm thinking more like, um, you know, Hey, a shout out to, to Daft Punk who after 28 years has called it a career as a band. Um, and I'm thinking of them and, and, and Guar. Um, I'm thinking of bands that have performed in costume and had sort of, uh, you know, kiss is an obvious example. Um, you know, really elaborate stage shows. I think beef butter and blood could be a band name, um, for a band that would maybe like perform with, I mean, I haven't even drank anything yet today, Sam, or smoked anything for that matter. Um, but beef butter and blood, I'm envisioning real possibilities here on for, for a music tour. Yeah, I could see that. I'd go on the beef, butter, and blood. Well, okay, now hang on. Now is beef, butter, and blood a band, or is beef, butter, and blood the, the festival? album? Or the album? Oh, I like that. Beef, butter, and blood sounds like an album name, and maybe the band is called like Budget Graze <laughs> Grazing, or or or. Are you even said it earlier? Um, you said uh, what was the band name that I, I I almost jumped in at the time? You said um, Corey Mathewson and his sleuthy brothers. Ooh, that could also be the that could be the band, or maybe that's a fringe play. The guy is a celebrated theater performer. Um, I wanted to get into a couple of emails. We really, we receive emails literally by the dozens every single day. And uh, some days we receive them by the hundreds. And, and we've told you, we've just been honest with you. Uh, you know, we, we are a small but mighty team. We do everything we can to respond to every email we receive. It's, it's you know, we try our best, but but I make a commitment to you that every show, I want to read a few of them because they're great. And, and real talkers take the time to share their thoughts with us. This is from Jared. Now I'll acknowledge, Jared wrote this before we brought on our beef ranchers today. So he may actually probably double down on the sentiment, but everybody's got to say on this show, Jared says, Jespo, Sam, uh, I want to thank you guys for reaching out and finding, he's talking, he sent me this after we talked to Dr. Frank Mitloner out of the University of California at Davis. He's, uh, you know, a, a, an agri-scientist and he talked to us about beef and sustainability and, and methane and, and cow farts. And he talked to us, is it really true that each cow is the same from an emission standpoint as a, a vehicle burning a thousand liters of gasoline? And, and he said, by the way, that's not true. Um, so Jared reaches out because it was Jared's email that originally prompted us to reach out to the doctor. Um, he said, uh, you, you reached out, you found someone to partially answer my question. Jared was the author of the trash talk email that started this whole thing. This, this is back to the beginning. And he says, my questions about sustainable beef, though I don't fully agree with Dr. Mitloner. I do appreciate the time you took to find someone who could attempt to answer my questions. Now, now the, the reasons I don't agree with him, number one, frankly, he's funded to a certain degree by the beef industry. Uh, which to me impacts his credibility. You asked him, Ryan, will people be eating meat in the future? And his answer was absolutely. Otherwise I wouldn't be doing my job. Jared says, I'd like to see somebody from the other side of the spectrum answer this. Cause although I don't doubt that Canada and the U S have a lower carbon footprint than many other countries, 
it's impossible to look away from things like, you know, Justin Trudeau looking into a meat trade agreement with Brazil, the largest beef producer in the world, when the majority of fires in the Amazon rainforest are caused to make way for cattle ranching because Canadian farmers can't keep up with our demand for meat, says Jared. So to get to my point, is it truly possible for beef to be sustainable or should we be leading the way like we are in so many other contexts by taking steps to get away from animal products? Jared says, I love real talk. Keep it up. Never stop poking all the different sides of that bear, because that's why I listen to the show that from Jared. Um, we want the show to, to approach issues as, as we attempt to approach issues in our real life, in our everyday life, which is in open-minded fashion and, and with courage. In other words, we will talk about wind and solar in, uh, you know, in a jurisdiction uh, that, that has proudly been an oil and gas economy for many years. We will talk about getting off animal proteins when, you know, on the heels of talking to beef ranchers. We don't, this is not a show that's going to be sort of towing the line, so to speak, on, based on certain sponsors or partners or geographical realities or audience dynamic. Uh, we're going to have people on the show that, that may uh, infuriate you, and we'll have people on the show that will excite you. And the entire purpose, the entire point is to get us thinking uh, about things from different perspectives, perspectives we may not have considered and to ultimately be able to form opinions that we can be confident in. I love this from Fat Dave Johnson. Uh, Fat Dave writes in and he says, you know, I was really touched a few days ago. You mentioned talking to your, your five-year-old son about the function of police. I don't know if you remember this. I, I, several days ago, I, I felt compelled to share my thoughts on how the Edmonton Police Service had, had managed a complaint that houseless individuals were, were, were seeking refuge from the cold uh, in about, you know, approximately minus 30 degree temperatures uh, in, a, in an LRT stop, in a train and transit stop in the city of Edmonton, Alberta's capital city. And police responding to a call and, and I, I imagine, you know, obeying the orders that they had received or at least following protocol, literally... Uh, based on witnesses, witnesses from the Bear Clan Patrol, which is a citizen patrol who went on the record talking to journalists, um, police literally took sandwiches out of these individuals' hands and sent them into the cold. And I was infuriated. And I still am, quite frankly. Um, I've calmed down a little bit, but I'm still pissed about it. Uh, we heard from a police officer. I believe I called him Austin the other day. I don't remember. Um, he asked uh, for our uh, uh, anonymity. Uh, which we do provide, by the way, uh, after we verified who the person is. So just so you know, this is not someone sitting in their basement writing in letters saying, yeah, I'm the mayor of New York City, and I'd like to talk to you about this. We do verify these. They come from legitimate sources. And the, and the officer wrote in, uh, first of all, as a proud real talker, and also said, hey, listen, um, we need to talk about policing, and we need to talk about these types of things. However, I know the officers that responded to this. I've worked with them personally. I know them to be compassionate people. So again, many sides to these stories. Someone's going to write in, I know now, and say, Jesperson's all siding the argument. That's a verb now. And I talked about walking with my son, Wyatt, through the neighborhood. We'd seen a police cruiser, and, and it was coming. It was driving up our street, and Wyatt got really excited. And, and, he, and I said, look, look, buddy, police. And, and Wyatt waved at them, and the, and the, the police officer, the, the gal behind the, uh, the wheel, she, she looked over, and she smiled at him, and then she hit the brakes. And uh, it means different things when a cop's going by and hits the brakes, right? Like if, if you're me and, and uh, you know, you're white and you're in an upper middle class neighborhood and you're with your little guy and the cop hits the brakes, um, it means that you're about to get a, a show. You're about to get a little treat, which they did. They turned on the lights and, and whoop, whoop, they hit the siren a little, you know, and why it was just delighted. You know, if, if you're black and you're walking through a, a neighborhood that, that, you know, would represent the demographic of a lower socioeconomic status and, and the cops are driving by and then they hit their brakes, you might be about to have a different experience. And, and, I, and I touched on that briefly. And I just said, you know, when, when it comes to recognizing privilege and when it comes to having these types of conversations, I'm going to lay my cards on the table. Um, I, when I show up to, this, to host the show every single morning, I commit to you, I'm going to lay my cards on the table. And I said that why it's five. So while he's started to ask questions about Black History Month, his kindergarten teacher is doing an amazing job. Uh, he came home the other day talking about Dr. Martin Luther King. And I just, I, I just couldn't, I mean, I was just so moved. But he hasn't really had, I mean, he can't, he's five. So we're teaching him these things as he goes. So Fat Dave says, I was touched by your mentioning of talking to Wyatt. 
it was a very impassioned monologue that, that Ryan, it resonated with me on several levels. It reminded me of a story with my own kid. Dave says, I used to live across the street in Edmonton from Canada Place, which is downtown Edmonton, right on Jasper Avenue, just kind of overlooking the River Valley. It says that my kid and I were out for a walk and they were in kindergarten at the time. And I, we, we were teaching them about pedestrian safety as kids that age, you know, they they learn about that right around that time. And there are a lot of police around that area. It's the downtown core. And we stopped at a crosswalk as a police car was approaching. The conversation went something like this. Hey, dad, why didn't that police car stop for us so we could cross? Well, because they didn't feel like they needed to, I guess. Dad, did you know that the police just broke the law? Yeah, I did, son. That means they either didn't think stopping was important or where they were going was more important. Yeah, but dad, they didn't have their lights flashing. And then Dave says, silent reflection. He says, I wish I could protect my kid from this reality, but I'm not aiming to lie either. I mean, my kid's figuring these things out all all on their own. And that was seven years ago. And since then, I just feel that the narrative of the police in urban centers has only reinforced this narrative with bigger and worse instances. And now, says Dave, now that my kid is gender non-conforming, it's of much more concern to me. I'm a lifelong musician in punk rock in Edmonton. Um, and despite only recently in my late 30s, elevating myself to what might qualify as middle class, though I'm an adult white male and this entire society is engineered for my success. And of course, I'm constantly checking my privilege. I'm not personally afraid of cops the way that a lot of people are forced to be, but I'm long way away from feeling safe around cops. And I imagine that'll always be the case. Fat Dave says, anyway, thanks for digging in and ultimately for going off. Yours is a unique view that the city and the province are fortunate to have. And I'm glad to have met and connected with you on a few occasions. That from Fat Dave Johnston. Uh, Really appreciate that. We want to hear about things from your neck of the woods. We want to hear about things through your perspectives. You drive where we go on this broadcast and your perspective is important to us. There's two things I want to leave you with here that are really important. Number one, email us anytime. Talk at ryanjesperson.com. That's the email address to use. You can also use the hashtag RealTalkRJ, but but oftentimes is one of the top trending hashtags uh, in Alberta and, and sometimes nationally, Real Talkers, when you really step up, um, those texts, those tweets rather, can get lost. Email is the best way to send something to make sure we're going to see it. And number two, make sure you take our Y Station question of the week. I know some of you had issues earlier in the week with this week's edition. Uh, The team at Y Station has rectified the software uh, problem and everything's ready to go here. It's an important question of the week and we're picking your brain on subjects that we know matter to you. The question coming up next Monday is going to be about the budget and how you feel about what we're going to learn about the budget in Alberta later today. And of course, our Friday roundtable tomorrow is going to touch on that. We want to know how you feel. We want to know where you're coming from. And the best way to do that is to participate in our question of the week. Again, just look under the top bar, right in the top right-hand corner of our website at ryanjesperson.com. These conversations happen because we have the proud support of sponsors that have joined us on this journey as we continue to build a talk show that reflects Canadians' perspectives. And that includes the team at Eden Landscaping, For more than 20 years, they've been taking your dreams, your talk, and turning it into reality. Now, whether that's a brand new swim spa, maybe, in your backyard, whether that's that fire circle, that fire pit that you've always been looking to build, or what about a full-blown outdoor kitchen? You're probably not traveling to Europe this year. Hey, consider investing in your own personal space. You might say, I don't have the money to do an outdoor kitchen, but I'd love to put some planters or some flower boxes out. They do that too. You can check them out online at Landscape Edmonton. And of course, if you ever forget about the web address, what was it again that Jesperson said? Just go to our website, ryanjesperson.com under the sponsors tab. You'll find all the links. We're also very proud to partner with the team at Alta Moving and Storage. It's no secret to them. They're not going to deny it. They know that moving is stressful for people. It's why they've built their business on taking the stress out of the mix 
as much as possible. Now, they're not going to be able to help you decide which of your old ratty t-shirts you're going to throw out. That's not their job. But what they can do is get those pod style containers, get them dropped off at your house so you can move at your pace, at your pleasure. If you need labor help, they can provide it. If you need long or short-term storage, they've got you covered there too at Alta Moving and Storage. And again, altastorage.ca is where you'll find them. And we're very proud this morning and excited to introduce you to a new builder, a new partner here that is joining the Real Talk family. The team at Alberta Blue Cross knows that running a small business is not a nine to five job. Neither is taking care of your employees. Uh, That's where a group benefit plan from Alberta Blue Cross can help with digital tools that do the heavy lifting for you from start to finish. Your employees enroll and manage their benefits digitally anywhere on any device. And as a plan administrator, you oversee the entire account in real time, all within your budget. You can learn more about how Alberta Blue Cross makes managing your health and dental, life and disability coverage simple and affordable at ab.bluecross.ca. And Alberta Blue Cross, welcome to the team. Tomorrow, again, the Friday roundtable gets going at 9 a.m. We're going to take on the Alberta budget. We're going to find out what it means for you your family, your business. You won't want to miss it. And out of the gates, just after 8.30 Mountain Time, the Federal Natural Resource Minister, the Honorable Seamus O'Regan, joins us to take your questions on wind, solar, nuclear, hydro. We're going to even get in to talk about orphan wells. That's coming up tomorrow on Real Talk at 8.30 Mountain Time. We'll talk to you then.